Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of moving parts to this, and obviously different schemes produce different outcomes. Uh, as my understanding, in, in rough numbers, that from the uh, historical shortfall scheme, the majority of the original applicants have been paid out. Uh, there's a significant issue with that in that most of those were paid out without the benefit of legal advice. Um, it's something that exercises us greatly. Um, but it's one of those things where there's so much to go at, where do you prioritise? Uh, within the convicted uh, cohort of clients that we have, uh, of the 73, uh, three have been fully paid out. Three? Three. That's three. Three, and then another, it's a slightly moving number, but between 28 and 30 have accepted the fixed £600,000 proposal. Um, most of the others have had some form of interim compensation, uh, but not final uh, conclusion. Let me just check this. Years after the key landmark cases, only three of those convicted have had a full and final settlement. Correct. I mean, I have some insights as to why I think that's the case. I think, um, I think there are three, in my mind, three key factors at play here, and it, it, it sounds uh, perverse to say this, but I'm not sure that enough resource is thrown at it in terms of the right resource into the right areas. So, uh, for example, uh, routinely with um, the overturned conviction cases, it's taking three to four months to um, get a response to routine correspondence on items three to of four loss. Months. Yep. Um, in the HSS, it's taking six months to get a panel decision on small numbers of cases, uh, which to me uh, is indicative of maybe not enough people sitting on those panels. Um, I equally think a real big issue, and I can't lift the bonnet here, I can only make, um, draw conclusions from what I see, but um, there are too many layers of bureaucracy. Um, we uh, have had examples of situations where um, decisions have needed to go through four layers of decision making to get an outcome. Um, so we can, we can agree something in principle with post office or lawyers it goes through various iterations and either comes back morphed in different form or doesn't come back at all. Um, and so I think that um, building on what Lord Abuthnot says, you know, that there is a need to streamline things here and, and produce a quicker process because I agree that, it, that there is a capability to resolve these, these matters in the course of this year. Uh, but there is another factor as well that comes into play. Uh, we need to um, give the sub-postmasters the benefit of the doubt uh, on key matters. So uh, as it stands at the minute, um, we're faced with requests for information uh, that go to finite detail in relation to heads of loss that have no supporting documentation, uh, either because of the passage of time or because the poor sub-postmaster was locked out of the post office 15, 20 years ago, and all the documents are in there. So post office have or held the documents, and now those people have been held to account on things that they have no support for. Um, I think I'd say as well that uh, there are some extreme examples here of, of document requests or information requests. So I look at the post office and their spend of 100, legal, 100 million pounds on defending the indefensible, yet yeah, I'm being asked to provide evidence of a client that's been to probation and spent money on £900 worth of travelling expenses over 15 years ago. So the proportionality is not there. Uh, and there is a really good opportunity now to change that dynamic. Um, and that's on the back of the 600, uh, on the back of the mass acquittal process. So we now seem to have a situation where, depending on the devil in the detail, but someone can almost self-certify they're not a criminal and open the door to £600,000 in compensation. If that self-certification is good enough in that forum, it's certainly good enough for innocent people that um, have been badly wrong to self-certify that it's cost us this, this and this, and therefore that forensic trawl should be relaxed and the benefit of doubt given to these poor people. Do you think that the bureaucracy is basically dragging its feet in providing redress? That's the only logical conclusion that, that I can come to. As I say, <coughs> I'm not here um, to pillory people. I think that, that we have very good relations at face value with, with, with people that we deal with, at both the business department 
and the post office, but it then seems to go into this machine, this abyss, uh, and it morphs back out months later in a different form. We've got the biggest miscarriage of justice in British legal history. We're years on from the key landmark case, and we still have red tape preventing redress for the victims. It all appears over-engineered to me. Douglas Chapman. Yeah, thanks very much, and thanks for joining us this morning. Um, Lord Arbuthnot, the uh, I, I noticed in your, your CV that you were previously chair of the Defence Select Committee, and I'm sure during that time uh, when you were serving the committee that uh, you've seen a whole range of procurement contracts that have gone awry. Um, where does this one sit in terms of the seriousness uh, of the impact it's had, not just on the sub-postmasters, but just in the confidence of the government's own procurement process? Well, this one sits quite separately from uh, things like th there was a something that the Defence Select Committee described as a fiasco, which was the FRES, the Future uh, Something Effects Service, uh, which cost many billions. But this one has such human implications that spread throughout the country um, for people who had been the leaders of their communities to be humiliated in front of those communities, that this is of a totally different order. And in terms of the £7 billion pounds worth of contracts that uh, Fujitsu have received from the government since 2012, <laughs> what do you think the expectations might be on the part of the sub-postmasters in terms of any future contracts being awarded, or you know, uh, uh, is there another horizon in your view that, that's sitting uh, somewhere in, in some other government department where the, the same supplier has been implicated? Well, there could be. Will you forgive me if I uh, tell you that I've concentrated mo mostly on this one, because it's just me and I haven't got a secretary or anything. Um, so I have concentrated just on this, but I hope that Fujitsu would accept that they have played a part in the devastation that has been visited upon the sub-postmasters. And they might also like to accept that they should play a part in the redress that those sub-postmasters need now. And uh, Dr. Hodgell, the, you know, we've heard a lot about compensation and what's coming forward from uh, either government or others. Uh, where, where do you think Fujitsu sits in terms of the, their obligation to provide compensation for the people who, have, as we've just heard, you know, have had their lives destroyed and you know, have really undermined the whole procurement process for, for future suppliers as well? I think that it's, it's fair to say that Fujitsu have a role to play. At, at the end of the day, though, the, 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 this isn't about a, f a flawed IT system in, in many senses. It's about decisions made on the back of that flawed IT system. So who made those decisions? Who's responsible for that? Fujitsu are certainly part and parcel of that. And I, and I think that um, it links back, in a sense, to um, why we need closure this year, because... Uh, part, part of that for, for, for the, the good people here is, is accountability. Um, we, um, and Post Office have seen this, we've got in excess of 100 psychiatric reports for people diagnosed with all sorts of depressive illnesses, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, paranoia, all the, everything that you can possibly think of. And there, there are two things that come out of those reports that um, Post Office are aware of, and one of them is... Um, to, to bring about um, an improvement in mental health um, is accountability, and Fujitsu are a part of that. Um, the other thing is closure to this litigation, closure, closure to this compensation, so that there is clear medical evidence that's, that, that draws a link between the mental health of postmasters and this ongoing trauma around the, the whole Horizon scandal. Thank you. Thank you. Perhaps I should say, uh, Chair, that uh, uh, Mr. Hodge and I know each other uh, professionally because he and his firm have given evidence to the Justice Committee in relation to other completely separate uh, policy uh, matters. Good, good to, to see you again. You too. Dr. Hodge. Um, perhaps you can just help me with this. 
Uh, at the relevant time, uh, there was a code for prosecutors in place. Uh, that code, I think I'm right in saying, applies to private prosecutors just, it, just as much as it does to a public prosecutor like the Crown Prosecution Service. Uh, and am I right in thinking that that code, amongst other things, sets out an obligation on the prosecutor to be fair and even-handed in their approach at all times? Correct. Is it also right uh, that uh, a private prosecutor, just like a public prosecutor, is bound by the Attorney General's guidelines, as they then were, on disclosure? Right. And disclosure obligations include uh, revealing to a defendant any material which may undermine the prosecution case or may assist the defence. Right. And therefore the post office acting as prosecutor would have been bound by both of those obligations. Right. And it's also true that that obligation to review cases as evidence unfolds and to review your disclosure obligations carries on from the start of the investigation till the conclusion of the trial. And beyond. Indeed. And potentially if appeals issues are raised. Right. I get the sense that there was a wholesale disregard of disclosure obligations. You've seen some of the files. Were they complied with as far as you can see? I've seen some of the files, I've heard some of the evidence. Um, I'd like to tread carefully as of course the, the statutory inquiry yes. at the moment is ongoing and considering some of these issues in the, the current phase. I think anybody that has seen some of the recent evidence in the inquiry will draw their own yes. obvious conclusions from that. When you gave evidence to the committee back in uh, December of 2021, uh, you referred to the number of false confessions uh, that had been referred to. And I think you mentioned that was a theme we now know uh, was uh, picked up in the television series. Um, again, your experience lawyer, you've come across these cases before. What is it, do you think, that caused uh, innocent people to make false confessions, confessions which were not true, to confess to something which they hadn't in fact done in these cases? You and I might have a reason as, it, as lawyers as to why, but for the record, what do you think? I think there's a, a raft of reasons. I think that the main one is probably an inequality of arms. You know, you're facing mm. this big beast in the post office with all the um, machinery that, that sits behind it. You know, you've got some poor person that is being accused of doing something hideous that that doesn't have that so you then obviously go on to a situation where there's a court process and a, a plea bargain that um, again is based on an entirely inequality of arms who's going to find x thousands of pounds for to obtain computer evidence at a time when they're not in employment um, and so um, it's um, it's all power to the elbow of removing from an institution such as post office the right to be the right to prosecute, to be the victim, judge, jury, executioner, and obviously at the end of it, beneficiary. There's also the point here, isn't it? May I, may yes, I, of course, Lord of Asaf, do come in. Um, the Horizon Compensation Advisory Board um, uh, put out a paper with the minutes of the meeting that we held on the 10th of January talking about the implications of the psychological effects on sub-postmasters and mistresses of the behaviour of authorities. And there's a paragraph there, the exploitation of fear through irresponsible conduct, which is worth reading. You happen to know, I'd review, uh, were all or most of these postmasters and mistresses um, legally represented at the time they were interviewed? They would have been by the time cases came to trial, of course, but when they were first interviewed? Not necessarily legally representative, it would be union representation. Yeah. My impression is very few. Thank you. And we talked about the duty to be fair and even handed that applies to prosecutors. We know that that applies to investigators as well. But we, we know uh, that there was a financial incentive uh, to post office investigators uh, in these cases. That seems perhaps to sit ill uh, with the uh, obligation to be fair and even handed. Uh, as an investigation prosecutor. Yeah, I mean, I, th I thought about this quite a bit. I think I think there's there's a certain cultural. Um, uh, it's very culturally ingrained. I think that, the, the, that there was a new IT system brought in. It was going it was going to catch out <coughs> a nation of dishonest people. And I think the narrative from there was to collect evidence to support that and to ignore anything to the contrary. I think that was one factor. 
which of itself would be a departure from the disclosure obligations. Correct. And the second site interim report referred to the primary motivation of the investigations being asset recovery rather than the investigation of what might have gone wrong. And therefore the approach that should be applied to a criminal investigation may yeah. not have been followed. Indeed. Uh, you mentioned, Mr. <coughs> the, the question of computer evidence. Uh, there was a time, uh, as I recall it, in the early 90s when the obligation was on the prosecution uh, to prove uh, uh, in effect, the computer evidence. Now, basically, apart from a, a fairly basic <coughs> statement uh, mm. that the computer was working and so on, it's, it's quite difficult at the moment to challenge computer evidence, isn't it? Is that something that needs to be looked at? Are there particular challenges around computer evidence? Well, I, th I, think, I think there's a wider question there around challenging everything, isn't there? You yeah. know, we've made yeah. certain assumptions about this this entity, this you know, this the, the post office, and if there's one big lesson to take from it all is to assume nothing. Um, you know, I've got some issues at the minute with specific cases where um, it may have been three or four years ago, I'd, I'd assume that these things couldn't have happened, but forgery of documentation and creation of fictitious accounts to dismiss people are now firmly in my sights as, well, this more, is more likely to have happened than not. So I, I, don't think <coughs> you can, I don't think you can assume anything now when it comes to the behaviour that's gone on over the last 20 years because I think every week there's a new revelation uh, and one good thing that's come from, or one of many things that's come, come from the dramatisation is the increasing number of whistleblowers that are prepared to come out and start to spill the beans where they didn't necessarily before have the, um, you know, have the, the, not the bravery as such, but, you know, the, you know the, the ability to do that. May I come in on the issue of the reliability of computer evidence there is a presumption which was brought in by, at the recommendation of the Law Commission that evidence produced by a computer uh, should, uh, there is a presumption of its reliability. I hope that if this case produces nothing else, that presumption will quickly be changed. Quite what to is up for discussion. <clears throat> But it needs to be changed because it is clear that very, very few, if any, computer programs are entirely reliable. Exactly. Can I just check, um, you said that many of the claims under the Horizon Shortfall Scheme and the Historical Shortfall Scheme were submitted without any kind of legal advice and obviously the ITV drama has created a much bigger profile of the issue. Do you think that there are many, many more people who suffered who are now going to come forward with legitimate claims for redress? Well, up to this morning, we've had in excess of 200 inquiries related to Horizon shortfall. New inquiries. New inquiries. Uh, we've equally had um, in excess of 20 that have asked us to re-look at settled HSS cases. Um, as I said earlier, my gut feel on this is there are a significant number of undersettled matters. Um, I take some of that intelligence from a, a small cohort of cases where we've secured substantial increased offers mm -hmm. um, that are still unsatisfactory. Um, in one case, uh, an offer from that went from 120,000 to 220,000. Um, in another case, um, similarish numbers but on average at least a 25% increase um, so there is real strong concern there that there are a number of undersettled matters uh, because the vast rump of those cases were settled without legal advice and in, and in fact settled at a time when interim payments were not routinely offered mm -hmm. um, that changed as did the application to request further information so it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a misconception to, to say that the smaller cases were settled off first because you may have a shortfall loss of a few thousand pounds, but if that in turn then gives rise to a suspension, termination and loss of business, the consequential losses are significantly more than uh, the, the original losses claimed. Mm. But the post office is making um, some play of the fact that 85% of people who have claimed under the Horizon Shortfall Scheme have had 
um, money paid out. What you're telling us is that there are potentially hundreds of more victims still out there, and that second, many of the victims have been shortchanged on the settlements they've received. Yeah, both, both, both are correct. I think of the, it, it may be a question to ask of the 85% that have settled, how many of those settled with legal advice? I think that would be a, a fair question to ask. I just came out of one sort of final topic, uh, and that's this. We talked about legislation to overturn these convictions or, or mass and all of that, but where does that leave the position of two classes of people? First of all, those who appealed their convictions successfully through the court process. It's been suggested by some commentators that we run the risk of, of devaluing, in effect, uh, the overturning of their appeals through the normal appellate process uh, by this route. But that's a, a, a fair observation, isn't it? How, 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 do we, how will we deal with that in, in a proportionate manner? This uh, solution is not a comfortable one in many different ways. It is, as the Minister has put it, the lesser of two evils. We need to get these convictions overturned as a matter of speed. I myself don't think that those o overturned appeals, which were uh, overturned in front of the court, would be devalued in any way. That's my own view, but we've got to deal with this and we've got to deal with it quickly. Um, I think I probably have to slightly disagree with uh, Lord Abathnot on that, on the basis of what I'm told by some of my clients. I think that um, they are relieved and welcome the news that there will be a form of fast track of those that are genuinely innocent. Um, I think they pick up on the commentary around um, the collateral damage of some genuinely guilty people, um, being able to access um, acquittal and uh, compensation, and some do feel uh, a cheapening of uh, exoneration as, as, a, as a result of that. Um, they've been through a process that's <coughs> taken upwards of three years, um, and therefore that's, that's a feeling that, that they, they hold, that, or some of them hold. So whilst there is a general um, groundswell of support for exoneration of um, the, the poor people that, that don't come forward because of the process it, it involved. There are <coughs> obvious, obvious complications that come from that. We know finally that about a third of the cases that were referred to the Criminal Cases Review Commission uh, were rejected by the Criminal, Criminal Cases Re Review Commission. They wouldn't take them to the Court of Appeal. We also know that the Court of Appeal having heard the case in full, um, dismissed the appeals, I think three or four cases. How should the legislation handle those classes of, of individuals? And are there lessons perhaps to be learnt as to the way the uh, test that the Criminal Cases Review Commission applies uh, should be uh, uh, reviewed or not? Can I come in on that? I think <coughs> the, the Criminal Cases Review Commission referred cases to the Court of Appeal on two grounds. First was that the reliability of Horizon data was essential to the prosecution and conviction of the post office applicant, uh, and it wasn't possible for the trial process to be fair. And the second was that the re reliability of Horizon, Horizon data was essential to the prosecution, and it was an affront to the public conscience. Now, since those cases were referred to the Court of Appeal, Things have come out within the public inquiry about the investigator's behaviour and about the post office's entire approach to the ethics of prosecution, which I believe take us way beyond the application of horizon data. And therefore, I think that this needs to be considered with great care, possibly those whose cases were overturned, they may need to be told, you have to go back to the Court of Appeal, but you will do so with government assistance, with legal aid, so that these things can be overturned by the Court of Appeal. But I think that that's uh, still up for uh, bottoming out, and I, we haven't come to any firm conclusion on it. Anthony, and then I'll bring in Jonathan Gillis. Thank you. Um, Lord Arbuthnot, can I just ask you to comment on last week's announcements from the Minister and how you feel about them? I feel very good indeed about it because 
this is a mass problem which required a mass solution. And I think his announcement on the overturning of convictions, precisely how that is actually done, we have yet to uh, bottom out. But his, that announcement was very, very welcome. Uh, I can't remember when I first called for it, but a uh, little time ago. And his announcement on the simplification of redress or compensation was also most welcome. I've come on to the point about simplification of compensation, but can I just say that where we are at the moment is a complete breakdown in trust in nearly every part of the system. And the Minister's announcement, do you think that is going to give trust and, uh, and confidence to those who are claiming? You started at the beginning saying it's a, and you've just said it again, a mass solution to, uh, to resolve the situation. How do you bring forward those people who have absolutely no faith in the system? who perhaps have no confidence in signing a letter saying they did no wrong for fear of prosecution later on. Those are good points. And there will be some who will continue to refuse to come forward. And I beg them to come forward. Uh, the signing of the letter, well, that may be, it may be quite difficult to draft such a letter for those who may be said to have committed false, ac false accounting. Were they, uh, do they sign to say that they didn't? I don't know. It's, it's difficult, this. But we will hammer it out in one way or another. Can I then just ask where you see the role of Parliament in on this? Because what we are about to do in terms of, a legisla in terms of legislation to overturn convictions is unprecedented. Indeed, this entire, whole situation is unprecedented, and it's horrific. But does this set a dangerous precedent for Parliament to start overturning convictions? How does the judiciary respond? And what happens in future cases? Um, it does set a precedent, but in such quite extraordinary <laughs> circumstances that it is hard, I hope, to see that precedent being repeated. Uh, the largest, as I understand it, the largest number of cases that had previously come before the Criminal Cases Review Commission uh, on any one issue was previously 10. When we're talking of a 1,000 produced by one organisation doing private prosecutions in a way which was quite abysmal, uh, I think that is quite difficult for uh, us to see repeated. Um, how will the judiciary respond. I don't think the judiciary is at all happy with its own part in these events, but I don't know exactly how the judiciary will respond. I hope they will accept that these cases need urgent um, overturning because we can't have more people going to their graves with convictions still on their records. Doctor, I've just got two last bits and then I'll, I'll hand back to you, Chair. Uh, Dr. Hudgel, Dan Needle uh, wrote a particularly interesting thread last week around the Horizon Shortfall Scheme, in which he said here was a compensation scheme that ran to 14 pages, required legal advice that he estimated to be in the cost of £10,000. That's what he would quote someone to be able to provide that advice to, and that had sort of slightly obscure phrases like consequential loss. To which the uh, actual and to which the definition was found in Appendix One. Why are we still putting up with a system that is just so deliberately opaque in terms of trying to help people get the redress that they need to? Why is a system like that even coming out to try and help people when it's not really doing the thing it's meant to do? I can I can only concur with you, and it's not it's not driven from this side of yeah. the fence. From this side of the fence, we want simplification. We want speed of outcome um, and it is a it, it is a source of, of frustration in all the schemes that there is inconsistency uh, and there is as, as I described earlier over engineering in all respects one final question which is can I, could either of you explain to me why the horizon system is still in use in a debate in 2014 and in 2015, I think Andrew Bridgen held a debate in 2015 in Westminster Hall in which it was rumoured that IBM was going to take over the system. There were then rumours that Amazon was going to take over the system. Why is the government, why is there still taxpayers' money going towards Horizon? Why is it still in place? And how can the post office continue to run using a system that has clearly betrayed so many people? 
What an excellent question, and luckily you have the Minister in front of you later on. Thank you. <laughs> Mr Gullis. Thank you, Chair. Lord Arbuthnot, the Sir Wynne Williams inquiry into the scandal is obviously still ongoing. You've raised your disappointment about the role of aud auditors not being considered as part of that. Why do you personally believe auditors should be part of this process? Because the auditors either did or should have noticed that there was a potential liability building up within the post office that was likely to give rise to costs of, we now see, a billion pounds. If the auditors failed to realize that, was it because they weren't looking at the right things uh, or was it because they were ticking boxes? Or did they realize that and not bring it to the right people's attention with sufficient oomph? I don't know. Thank you. And the final one for me, sorry, Chair, is uh, for you again, sorry, Lord but not. What, overall with the inquiry, what are you hoping it will achieve? What would you like the, what's the desired outcome of the people that you've been working with? I actually have faith in the inquiry. And I hope it will get to the bottom of who knew what and when, of what actually happened. I think we're only halfway to finding that out at the moment. And then I hope it will make some serious recommendations. We've got so many things that have gone wrong here. Possibly the adversarial system of our court processes uh, is one of them. The notion of private prosecutions is another. The presumption that computer evidence is reliable is another. How uh, There are lots of recommendations that I hope will come out of the inquiry, and I believe, given the way that Sir Wynne Williams and Jason Beer KC is doing, uh, are doing their job, I think they will. Out of interest, sorry, Lord of Arthur, with uh, you worked as Minister of State for Defence Procurement, if I'm not mistaken. So obviously, are used to having to look for external contractors when it comes to looking for government contracts. Do you think it'd be appropriate for the government to cease any new contracts being given to Fujitsu until this inquiry is concluded and until they have paid their part back to the victims and obviously back to the British taxpayer, therefore, for the role that they have likely played in obviously this Horizon scandal? There are some areas where a single supplier is the only viable option. And we mustn't cut off our noses to spite our, face, uh, to spite our faces, as it were. Um, but I do think that Fujitsu's reputation has been seriously damaged by this, and that will play a major part in future procurement issues. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, you very much. Just very briefly, Charlotte Nichols and then Ian Labour. Thank you, Chair. It was just a quick point of clarification, <coughs> Dr. Hutchell. You said in your earlier answer um, that there was a feeling by some of the claimants that a kind of mass exoneration would mean that there was collateral damage of potentially genuinely guilty parties within that. How do you, if such people exist, ascertain who they are when the evidence against everyone was obviously so problematic? I mean, that's, it's, it's, not, it's not an easy question. I, th I think you know, th there has been plenty of commentary around that there are within that court inevitably people that are genuinely guilty, and it's, it's, it's a really tricky one. But um, Is that just on balance of probability, or do you have reason to believe specifically that there are potentially guilty people within that? It's of both. I think, I, think, I think one of the issues is what, what, what does that number look like? Um, it may be a, t a tiny number and it may be a price worth paying. M my job today is to convey t to this committee the, the feeling of a number of my clients, which I will reiterate, is that they are generally um, overwhelmed in a positive way that there is going to be exoneration of those that are genuinely innocent. Uh, in a wider context than just the narrow interpretation of as a rise and as intrinsic to the prosecution, but based on the whole um, prosecutional strategy and behaviour of post office. Um, but inevitably, this isn't this isn't an easy subject, and it, it does come with a number of caveats. Um, and I guess that the devil is very much in the detail of how this all unfolds. Thank you, Thank you. Thanks. Uh, 
Dr. Hutchell, you, you mentioned before that um, a lot of the victims are suffering from paranoia, post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, we've seen people uh, spat at in the streets. We've seen their kids spat at at school. We've seen the likes of Seema, uh, Mr. Uh, Janine Paul, uh, <coughs> was incarcerated. We've seen Joe Hamilton, who was threatened w with jail. We've seen all these, we've seen suicides. We've seen all these difficulties. Now, in a normal case for compensation, you would have loss of earnings, future, uh, and past loss of earnings, you have Smith and Manchester, you would have um, pain and suffering. And I'm just wondering how y you would look at pain and suffering on this scale for different individuals who will suffer differently as a consequence of, of this situation. It must be extremely complex. I've got to say, a £75,000 on this issue is not just uh, paltry, it's an absolute insult. Yeah, I think that there's a lot in your question. Um, and, and the 75,000 relates to the HSS scheme. Um, there's a 600,000 pound package that relates to um, the overturned conviction cases. Every case is determined on its own merits. Every case is determined in accordance with ordinary principles of English law. Um, so every case will never be compensated to account for the losses that people genuinely suffered. Um, I think that, as I say, um, in terms of the go forward, the, the, the whole idea around the £600,000 package was quite a creative solution suggested that, that swept up a number of cases. So, for example, someone that was close to retirement that would have a small loss of earnings claim. That sort of offer would be attractive. So these are some of the things that we need to look at to find to solve these problems are creative, simple solutions. Um, there is within um, the way that these compensation claims have been assessed um, an allowance for exemplary damages to reflect uh, the conduct of post office. But there's another wider point that you raised that just occurred to me to mention is that um, it's not just the sub-postmasters here that suffered greatly. There's another class of, of people that cannot be compensated in any way, and that's the spouses, the children, the parents. Yeah. The spouses that have um, miscarried um, because of the stress of things, spouses that have committed suicide because of the stress of things, the kids that have got behavioural disorders that ended up out of school early and, and, and whose adult life is now shattered because of that, uh, parents that have died, um, estranged from family members, generations of, of sub-postmasters where granddad has believed um, the post office over grandson and, and then has, has sadly died before that relationship can be repaired. So there's a whole raft and category of of people that are not comp compensatable, um, and that's another strand of, 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 of this scandal that needs to be looked at, in the same way as people that were not sub postmasters but suffered financial loss directly are not compensatable at the moment either. So, there's, so the scandal is in the thousands, but it could be in the tens of thousands. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Let me just finally bring in Mr Pawsey and then we'll conclude this session. Yeah, can I just ask Lord Abuthnut, who's a very experienced politician, who's been dealing with this matter for 20 years, why has it taken us so long to get to where we are today? I don't want to say pass. Um, it's a difficult subject. You have people who have been convicted or plead, pleaded guilty to crime up against the most trusted brand in the country. I think that's at the heart of it. What the post office failed to realize was that the most trusted brand in the country was the most trusted because of the relationship that the sub-postmasters had with their communities. It wasn't the most trusted because of the brilliance of its management or the price of its stamps or the sparkling nature of its publicity machine. It was the relationship between the sub-postmasters and their communities. And when they were vilified and humiliated, uh, the brand <coughs> then rolled into overdrive. I think that may be it. Complicated subject as well. Computer stuff, very difficult. Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much indeed. That concludes...
our first session. Thank you so much to both of you. You've told us today that a tiny number of people have had redress. You've told us that there is red tape that is dragging out the process for months. You've told us that there are hundreds more potential victims out there. You've told us that many of the victims who have had redress may have been shortchanged. You've told us the legislation is potentially welcome and Fujitsu have a role to play in providing some compensation. You've set the stage very well for the evidence that we're about to hear and we're very grateful to you for coming and speaking to us this morning. That concludes this session. Order, order. Thank you. The proceeding is currently suspended. 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 Five, four. Order, order. Welcome to the second session of the Business and Trade Committee this morning, looking at the way we accelerate redress for the victims of the largest marriage of justice in British legal history. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Alan Bates and Joe Hamilton uh, to give us evidence this morning. Do you want to just say a word, as if it's needed, of introduction for the record? Mr Bates. Well, my name is Alan Bates and I'm the founder and I suppose really the main mover with the Justice for Sub-Postmasters Alliance. Thank you. Joe Hamilton. And I'm Joe Hamilton, ex-sub-postmistress from South Wimbra. Thank you very much indeed for joining us today. If I can start with um, you, Mr Bates, are you now slightly furious that after a high-profile drama, after everything that you've been through, there are still so few people who have actually seen full redress for the scandal that was done to them. How are you feeling? I'm uh, frustrated, if you put it mildly. I mean, th there is no reason at all why full financial redress shouldn't have been delivered by now. It's It's gone on for far too long. People are suffering, they've been, they're dying, we're losing numbers along the way. And it's it just seems to be tied up in bureaucracy, and that's that seems to be the big problem. I mean, it's this scheme, the current scheme, started in March twenty twenty two, and I mean that's what eighty well twenty two months ago now, and we still there are very few cases that have actually gone through or come out the other end. So, it is frustrating to put it mildly. Okay. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm in a different scheme. I've been in the overturn conviction scheme and, and I know that is painfully slow and they have to literally drill into the minute details of everything they think you might be claiming, you know. Um, <laughs> it's almost like you're a criminal all over again. You've got to justify everything um, and they get forensic reports for this and forensic reports for that and you put it back into the machine and then months later it comes back with a query you send it back and months later again it comes back and you know there has to be a way that I mean I don't have access to all the data but there, there must be a way where you can see people in different bands and sort out a simplified version that won't be so costly for the government either. But it, it sounds like after all the hell that you've been through you're still going through hell to finally get justice done. It's almost, yeah it's almost like you're being retried because everything you say you'd like, they say, oh, we'll justify that and justify that. And, and it just goes on and on and on. And you must be in touch with others who are having similar experiences, yeah. aren't you? Yeah, I mean, everything has to be backed up with paperwork and yeah, it's just nonsense, you know. What's, what's the impact on you of having to go through all of that over and over and over again? 
Well, I'm pretty much out the other side, but so, you know, I'm fighting for, for the group that still haven't had, well, they haven't had, well, they had virtually nothing. I mean, I I'm not privy to what they actually have had, but I've heard, you know, they've had tiny interims and, um, and literally they're in this factory of bureaucracy that, that just swallows up paperwork. Mr. Bates, have you, yes. had, have you had evidence and experience shared with you of what people are going through to try and finally get what they're owed in terms of redress? Well, uh, I mean, I, I'm only involved with the GLO group, as in the group litigation order group, the ones who um, brought the court case against post office initially and who got left behind afterwards, re realistically, but uh, eventually they're caught up. But, I mean, people, I mean, people have spent a lot of time again with their lawyers. Their lawyers have got their cases already sorted. In many instances, their cases have been submitted to the department but they're sat there. They're not moving through. I mean, recently, well, sorry, we were given assurances that after 40 working days, that cases would receive a first offer. Well, generally, I know that most people haven't had a first offer. I can speak firsthand about my personal case. I mean, that was submitted towards the beginning of October. Uh, I mean, today it will be the 66th day working day and uh, allowing for Christmas and New Year that I'm still waiting for my first offer and I'm being told that I won't receive anything or a first offer until the end of this month which will be 77 working days or almost double the expected um, time. So after everything you've been through after all of this time the delays are still dragging on? Yeah I, I mean I I hear a lot of stories about um, that lawyers are, uh, oh, sorry, government lawyers or the, the firms that governments are using for lawyers are not happy about working extra hours or working at weekends or working evenings. There obviously isn't enough of a resource being put in at that end, at that end to actually deal with these cases. And that's what's really frustrating. I know the lawyers that I'm using, which are being dealt with a lot of cases, have a huge team working on them, and they're piling the cases through, but they, it, they're just not moving. They hit a dead end once they go into, uh, into the department. So are you saying that the people who are processing the claim are not busting a gut to actually get the job done? Oh, gosh, yes. I mean, <laughs> I mean... Uh, after my after my claim had gone in, uh, and mine's just in the queue like everyone else's, not being dealt with specially at all. But I mean, uh, after mine had gone in, it took them, I think it was 53 days before they asked three very simple questions. I mean, it, it, it's madness. The whole thing is madness. It's not been driven. And there's no transparency behind it, which is even more frustrating. We, you know, we do not know what's happening to these cases once they disappear in there. I mean, I know we like red tape in this country, but I mean, this is insane. No, it's bogged down. It absolutely bogged down in red tape. Okay. Julie Marston. Thank you very much, Chair, and welcome to you both. Um, the ITV drama has undoubtedly provoked a huge response from the public all across the country. Um, empathy for the incredible, dreadful situation you've been in for such a long time and outrage on the same thing. Um, one of the things that strikes me and I think strikes a lot of people is that postmaster after postmaster were telling the same story. They were in the same position, telling their truth, telling the truth and were not believed. And in fact, were told that you're the only one. If people have watched that drama and are thinking to themselves with incredulity, how on earth could this happen? What's your assessment and what would you tell people who watch that? Your, from your experience, how on earth could that have happened? Alan, can I start with you? How would it happen? Um, I, I really think it was because of post office. I mean, when you take on a, a sub post uh, office, you actually invest a, a large amount of money in that business. 
And as happened in my case, they when they fell out with me, they walked off with that amount of money. And I think a lot of people feel there's a financial gun held to their head if they start kicking off or start raising too many uh, problems with post office. And cases like mine, cases like Lee's, I mean, the, these become reasonably high profile in the area and post office like to push them through or they used to like to push them through. I don't know if they still do as examples, as warnings to other to keep your head down and do as you're told. What about you, John? I, I was the opposite. They they convinced me that it was all my fault. Um, I wasn't tech savvy at all back in back twenty years ago, and yeah, they convinced me it was my fault. And that kind of it was before the days of social media, so you felt like you were. I really was alone, and I thought I must have pressed something and reversed something that then doubled the next day. And yeah, I I just thought I'd made a hash of it, but. <laughs> when ultimately I went to court and it, it made the national papers and people rang me up after seeing the piece in the paper and I realised it wasn't me, it wasn't just me, then you it just makes you so angry that, you know, they literally gaslit me for about three years that, you know, and turned me, well, not into a basket case, but pretty much. Um, and then I just, that lit a fire. Um, and yet, thank goodness we had the publicity because we joined up. But, you know, that is wrong. But it's taken this long and this much money to get to where we are today. And, you know, I know a lot of the group and they are literally falling apart, <coughs> waiting for the end of this to be able to put it behind them. So, yeah. so yes, so the turning point is not feeling alone. And But actually... I mean, these are, we, we use terms like the post office and Fujitsu, but actually you're dealing, on, when you were going through this, still are going through this, you're dealing with individual people. Can you explain how that felt, that, that you were up against, you were talking to individual people, but you couldn't get through to the big institutions that you're actually dealing with? It's, it's very hard to imagine how that must have been. Yeah, and a, lo a lot of people, then went to their MPs because that was Alan's brainchild to go to your MP. I mean, fortunately, I had James, but not all MPs listened, you know, because you kind of think the post office is trusted and what are they, they pleaded guilty in court. So who, I mean, who believes you, you know? I mean, I was lucky James was curious and um, had had some dealings with um, the Chinook failing. So he, he got curious because he had four people in his constituency. But I think it's the feeling that nobody's listening you know when you say you've got a problem you just need people to listen mm. and do you think um alan that your experiences and this process that's still going being here today and, and the inquiry do you think that that will help stop miscarriages of justice and repetitions of this kind of scandal uh, are you is it, you're talking about broadly on other instances or whatever um, in which case, I, I hope it sends a warning shot across the bows of these big corporations that what the, the what they actually do and decide and the way they they work uh, really affects people right down at the front line of their organisations and um, it's it and I think it's one of the failings that has been with a lot of the other things like the banking scandals or the blood scandals. People in high in jobs of uh, I don't know, high responsibility, that they're, they're not being held to account at the end of the day. And this, I'm hoping in, in this particular instance that people are held to account and that will demonstrate to others <coughs> keep your eye on the ball with what you're doing. So do you think this experience will help Definitely. In the future. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's almost like the other way around to what happened to Lee. Hopefully, if people get held to account, it might warn them not to do this to ordinary people again. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Can we just check, um, Alan, when it comes to Fujitsu, what is their culpability in this? And what is the compensation that you think they owe, frankly, to the British taxpayer and indeed to you? Well, I think this is very much a, a question for, for Sir Wynne and the inquiry to answer. 
Um, my gut feel on this, having looked at lots of paperwork over the years, <clears throat> is you know how much uh, did post office really know in the early days, and how much did government really know in the early days about what was happening at Fujitsu. And I, I think everyone's going to be surprised about how much was known. Um, but I mean, that's for Sir Wynne to establish with the, the inquiry. Are you comfortable with taxpayers' money being spent on Fujitsu right now? <laughs> I, I don't know what the other options are. Yeah. Do we have other, other um, IT suppliers, big enough IT suppliers in this country? And I believe they're quite entrenched. An awful lot of defence systems and a whole host of um, other, other systems as well. So. Yeah. so, any perspective on that? Well, I pretty much concur with that. But he, you know, um, yeah. That, I guess so. Win is, is where it's at. He'll find out who was culpable through. On, and, on the journey because it goes back so long he needs to get to the bottom of who knew what when and then if anything criminal has taken place that they should face prosecution and um, they should share if, if it's proved they're culpable they should have their share of the um, compensation you know they should pay their share if, if, I, if I may if, yeah, please if I may just add something to that uh, Jen it's I mean <clears throat> You're going back 20 odd years when it's happened. I should imagine a number of um, staff would have changed place. There would have been big changes in, in the company. Um, so uh, um, holding those currently um, uh, to account for, for what people did 20 years ago this might be, seem a little stiff. If they can actually show that the organizing, organization has changed, and that it is willing to own up and look after, i.e. compensate or repay government for what's happened in the past. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Joe, you took your case to the Court of Appeal uh, yeah. in the end. Did yeah. you do that via the Criminal Cases Review Commission? Yes, eventually. <laughs> it took it, a long time. It took a long time? Yeah, they waited was, for Justice Fraser. What was your experience of the Criminal Cases Review Commission process? Uh, well, if I'm honest, uh, I applied and I didn't hear anything for years, literally years. And every now and again, you get a three month letter saying, we're still looking at it, we're still looking at it. And then it became apparent that they were waiting for the, the, the high court litigation before they'd make up their minds over anything. It became apparent. Did they tell you that or did you work that out yourself? We worked that out. Yeah, we did. We did hear on the grapevine that they they wouldn't do anything, as it was so close to the um, mm -hmm. litigation set sort of you know the, the judgment coming out. They wouldn't do anything until it came out. When it got to the court of appeal, the post office in your case conceded yeah. that, that they behave, behaved improperly, yeah. and the judgment of the court of appeal set out in details what was wrong uh, yeah. with the process and why your conviction was unsafe. Mm -hmm. So. Mainly because they did it when they knew I hadn't done it. They, yeah. they, they but you went me. through that process. Yeah. How, 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 what's your reaction to a piece of legislation that exonerates everybody, including those people who haven't gone through the process that you did? I mean, where, where does that leave you feeling? Does that diminish your um, acquittal by the Court of Appeal? Or no, I, don't, I don't think it diminishes mine, but, you know, a bit of you thinks... But then it, something's got to happen because there's 900 cases, you know, it's, it's yeah. yeah. Not perfect, do I get the sense, but you're not... Not perfect, but I think it's the only way. Yeah. Um, Ian Lavery. Thanks, uh, Chair. Good morning, uh, Mr Bates and Ms Hamilton. I wonder the threat of, of a prison sentence what sort of impact that actually had on you? Yeah, yeah, obviously, it must have been horrific. Yeah. It really must have been horrific. I wonder if you could <coughs> explain to the committee, you know, when you were actually on the helpline trying to seek advice from the post office and you actually had your computer in front of you and they were explaining how to remedy the issue and then your deficit absolutely uh, well it doubled i believe yeah. Yeah, in yeah, front of your eyes can I explain to the committee how we actually felt at that precise moment of time 
I mean, at the time I felt um, helpless. When they told me I was the only one it had ever, it, that was having problems, I, I just presumed it was me because you know I didn't know any better. And I always thought they said reverse this and reverse it. And I thought, oh, it'll, it'll all sort itself out. Um, but it didn't. And it's, you know, <laughs> it was, they kept my wages and then I remortgaged and put money in. And because I had such a long lease on the shop, um, I knew if, if they sack, because they said they'll sack me, and then I thought, well, that the whole thing will collapse, and I felt I had no choice but to run with it and keep putting money in. Absolutely desperate situation, and I mean the the, the reports and many of them that might be exaggerated. I'm not sure. I see that you 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 re mortgage, you, yeah, twice. you borrowed money off your yep. your parents, etc. What a what a horrendous situation to find you, yourself in, and you, you eventually repaid. Uh, the money back to the post office. Um, have you any idea where that money went? No, I've heard it goes into the suspense account and it, and then eventually it gets hoovered into um, profit and loss. But how would gone. you feel? How would you feel, uh, Miss Hunt, if you thought that your money was put into the, the post office accounts um, and the profits from that account? <laughs> went to dividend holders whilst you were suffering the way you were uh, and potentially some top executives in the post office received some of your money in terms of bonuses. Ironic, isn't it? <laughs> how, how, how would that actually make you feel, honestly? Yeah, well, it, it's sickening, really, to be oh. honest. Um, the fact that we were... We were shouting so loud at one point and, and everything was known and yet our money was just being played with, you know, because they looked profitable at one point and it was our money. Thanks very much for, for, for that. Uh, uh, Mr Pierce, the last week the, the, the government announced a, a promised upfront payment offer of £75,000. Um, I, I wonder what your initial reaction is to that what the reaction is from the people who uh, you've been in contact with and you know will many of them people be taking up the seventy-five thousand pound or do you believe that uh, you know like there'll be a large proportion or what proportion in fact do you believe will, will accept that or will, will you know march towards full compensation um, I, I, th I think there probably will be some that it, it will suit in there but uh, at the moment I don't think there's any detail that's been published about it, or well, that was my understanding. And, and the other question about it is that the few cases that have gone through uh, in the GLO scheme, um, which I always refer to as the low hanging fruit, which are the, the low value ones. I mean, will they be able to claim a top up to the 75,000 mm. pound as well? Uh, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of questions to be answered about the scheme at, at present and I, I don't think until they publish the details it's a bit hard to comment and the, basically the the huge question is can a figure ever be calculated which will fully redress the uh, the situation that individual poor sub postmasters found themselves in it's been really interesting already this morning uh, Alan uh, to see that potentially uh, spouses of victims, um, children, uh, family members uh, in no way will be compensated as a result of that. How do we actually calculate the correct type of compensation for each individual involved? You'll never get it exactly right. But I mean, this is something I've been after for a while, that where there has been health or mental issues in the family along the way, they need to be assessed as part of this scheme and, and they, it needs to be transparent and it needs to be consistent across the whole board as well. Because at present, it's not included in a sub postmaster's claim. Uh, I mean, and I think when I've raised this in the past, government have said, oh, well, we do, we do consider it when we're working it out. But it's not structured, it's not transparent and it needs to be introduced. And as far as the GLO scheme goes, uh, I think it probably affects maybe a fifth or a sixth of all the claimants. It may be more, but it's around that sort, that sort of figure. Um, so, but I mean, you, you're right. It, it, 
this financial redress will never will never put, put things back for people but this is money this is something in which I, I get annoyed about when people call it compensation this is money that they that they are due this is money that, to put them back into a position that they would have been in had post office not done what it did to them so it's not really compensation which is why i keep calling it financial redress <laughs> Sorry. I think I think what you're saying basically just sorry just to conclude a lot of the money in the first place was yours anyway and you're just getting it back is that fair to say that's certainly a part of it but it's also the loss as we've been discussed before it's the loss of the earnings that they've got it's the loss of their investment in there you know it's all this that they would have had in the future thanks oh just Thank you, Chair. One of the recurring themes throughout this has been all of the people that thought that it was only happening to them and the <coughs> gaslighting that you referred to happening, Joe. The Justice for Subpostmasters Alliance has obviously done some absolutely extraordinary work in convening those affected, supporting them and seeking justice. But I'm interested to know your role, your view of the role of the National Federation of Subpostmasters within this. <laughs> as surely there's alarm bells that should have been going on there and an expectation from their members that they would get support that didn't materialise. Do you think an independent trade union could have made a difference here? If I could start with you, Alan. Oh, yeah. I mean, the Federation were, were, were in bed with post office from day one. Uh, and as far as I know, they probably still are because they're paid for, lock, stock and barrel by post office. Uh, it should be entirely independent. Uh, it really has to be. Uh, I mean, it, it's utter madness. They've refused, they've refused to support any sub-postmaster in any legal action against post office. In fact, I believe it was at, in, involved in, sorry, it's incorporated into their charter that they were not allowed to act against post office, otherwise they'd lose their funding. Joe? Yeah, well, the only advice I got from them when I rang them up, when I knew they were, well, I, I rang them up to arrange an audit. They said, well, well, we'll arrange the audit. You just go find yourself a good criminal lawyer. And that was the only help I got from them. Mm -hmm. um, there, there was no question of where's the money gone? You know, could it be this? Could it be that? And they just said, you go find yourself a lawyer. I mean, they knew it was inevitable. You know, why didn't they? stick up for me so yeah they are in bed with the post office unfortunately and justice Fraser's judgment bears that out and so do you believe that they share some of the culpability for what's happened as yeah it i mean have they had our membership for you to work out that this was a, a widespread issue they must have known they must have known but it will come out of the inquiry thank you Miss Lavery has already covered the questions that I, I wanted to ask, um, and, and rightly so, but I just wonder if I could ask you both very briefly. On the 17th of December, Lord Arbuthnot held an adjournment Westminster Hall debate, and then on the 29th of June 2015, Andrew Bridgen held a Westminster Hall debate. Both of them ident identified that the Horizon scheme could be remotely accessed. Both of them identified the fact there were bugs in the system. And then, according to my timeline, in 27, both, are, both in 2014, the second site report response from the post office maintains remote access to Horizon branch accounts is impossible. Then again, in 2017, the post office admits in court the previous assertion that remote access to Horizon branch accounts was impossible. How do you respond to that when you were three, four, five, six, seven years right calling out the fact that remote access was possible? I just, I'd like to hear how you respond to that when both the people you were talking to in Parliament, when you were raising it within your groups. I just wonder if you could add some comments to it. Joe, should we start with you? Here we are nine years after that, and uh, it's still not sorted out. I mean, it's <laughs> how long have you got? <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's shocking that it's taken this long and cost this much money just for something that we've been banging on about for years. Uh, Mr. Bates. Yeah, I mean, we've always known that we we were right. And it was just the post office decided to try and control the whole narrative over the years because of their power and money and all the, all the rest of it. And they had the ear of politicians. They used to brief them. 
and they used to, uh, and yeah, it was very very hard to 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 battle against them. But we always knew we were right. But and there was a ma- as we know now, there's a major cover ups been going on. The cover ups almost as worse uh, as bad. Oh, sorry, it's far worse than the actual initial crime and the prosecutions of individuals in all of this. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I just want to follow up on Anthony's point. Just there. Do you think the post office was naive and they just believed Fujitsu? Or do you think they were deliberately concealing something? Or was there something else? If I start with you, Alan. Yeah, I think post office didn't have the technical expertise at the outset when they brought this system in. And they very much re- relied upon their supplier to also be their IT experts and advisors along the way. And I think that was a major, major uh, decision, a major problem that they did. Realistically, even if they didn't have the, the in-house expertise, they should have brought in a third party to a... a assist them along the way and not rely on Fujitsu. And was that your experience whenever you would call the help desk, for example, was it your experience that the the help desk didn't have the capability and the knowledge to assist? Well, I didn't even know there was a Horizon help desk. That's how helpful the, um, the national desk were. They didn't even tell me. They just said, oh, well, you do this and this and this, which made the whole thing worse. But no one ever told me about the Horizon help desk. Because when I took over, I took the post office over pre-Horizon, and I never had a, not pre-Horizon, but pre-Electronic, yeah. and I, I never had a problem until it went electronic, and I, I'd only ever dealt with the National Help Desk, but, um, yeah, they didn't tell me about the Horizon Help Desk, so. If I just follow on from Anthony's um, question, are you aware to date, with the Horizon system still being used, of any continuing faults? Has anyone approached either of you at any point to ask whether or not the system that is still being used is resulting in faults? I mean, I've heard some things that, you know, I have no proof of it, but I've heard it's it's not brilliant. It's still not brilliant. So. Thank you, Joe. Alan? I, I mean, I've spoken to some postmasters in the past who will give me examples of failings within the system still. So, yes, it, it, it's still ongoing. Thank you. Anything else? Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr Bates, Ms Hamilton, I first of all apologise. I might be one of the only people in the country who's yet to actually watch the ITV drama, not through any deliberate choice, but with having two young children, I'm stuck between yeah. Port Patrol <laughs> and, uh, and many other shows and evenings and normally fall asleep whilst trying to get them to bed. Thank you for that but my, uh, I know, well, uh, just to that, but my, I, my father is a good judge of character, someone who is a very godly man. And only once in my life has he ever sent me a raging text message, which shocked me to my core. And it was following this ITV drama and seeing the injustice that you and many others have had to suffer. And that's why I wonder, so far as you're concerned, do you think despite what... Minister Hollenrake has said on the floor of the House and obviously in subsequent interviews about emergency legislation, about the processing scheme, obviously the drama actually bringing to the public's attention what you've both had to go through as many of the, all the other victims. Do you actually truly believe justice will ever be achieved? If I start with you, Miss Hamilton, first. Well, it'll never let my mum and dad see me have my conviction course, so to me that's what it all looks like. But, you know, apart from that... Um, we need to see deeds, not words. You can you can say things, but I just think for everybody now to draw a line under this, the the very minimum is the group of the GLO group who are still left looking for money. It needs to be fast tracked. There has to be a way of applying a bit of common sense to this and cutting out all the red tape. Mr. Bates, sorry. Yeah, they, they've got, Joe is right, they, especially the GLO group. Well, I mean, all of them, but I mean, the GLO group, they've been at this, many of us, for 20 years or so. And they've got to put this out. You know, I, I was talking to one of the group at the weekend. She's 91 years old. How many more years has she got to wait for financial redress? I mean, has she got to wait till she gets a telegram from, from the king? I just, you know, this is, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous how long the system is holding this up. It is absolute madness, and it's very unfair, and it's cruel. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you very much indeed. Let me just um, conclude with a, a couple of questions that we just need to uh, that we just need to check. Um, do you think that there are many victims still out there who haven't yet come forward, Mr. Bates? There are people contacting me now who have had losses over the years and have disappeared, and I, I I'm sending them on to lawyers these days. Um, but so the, yes, they are starting to come through again. No, I had I had a text in the taxi on the way over from Good Morning Britain this really? morning from someone who'd been to prison. Um, oh and so I'm going to pass her on to Neil. Um, when I said, give me a chance, I'll get, get out of this and I'll get back to you. And um, yeah, so I, I think there are people out there. And we've heard that um, some people who have <coughs> taken financial redress didn't get legal advice when they put their claims in and may therefore have been shortchanged. Is that your view too, Joe? Yeah, uh, well, for sure it will be, <laughs> yeah. Okay, Mr Bates, is that your perception? Yes, yeah. <laughs> and so finally, what are, the, what are the key tests for the legislation, <laughs> Mr Bates? What do you think this legislation that the government has now promised must achieve? I'm sorry, which part of the legislation? I'm There's new legislation that I think is going to propose mass overturning of the convictions no. to speed up the path to redress. What's the key tests when that bill hits Parliament here, at, we hope in weeks, let's hope it is weeks, what, what, how will you judge it, whether it's good enough? Well, I, I suppose really if it draws many more people out of the woodwork and actually come forward. Yeah. It, do you know what would be ironic is if those people that just come forward would get their money before the group yeah. get fought for this. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much indeed for your evidence today after everything that you've been through. We are truly grateful for uh, the evidence that you've given. You've told us that the process of redress is like being tried all yeah, over again. You, you feel like you're the guilty one. You know, why should you, you know... I've not claimed for anything I'm not entitled to. I'm not lying about anything, you know, but you have to back it all up with everything. It's like, yeah. they've got you've my tax returns. They can see, you know, what's so difficult. Yeah, you've then gone on to tell us that you don't think, frankly, the bureaucracy is working hard enough to speed up justice and redress. You've said something that, that has got to happen. You've welcomed the idea of legislation. But you've also warned us that there are no details that have been published. Uh, there's no details about this £75,000 idea. And crucially, there's no transparency about it either. No. No. So those are big questions that we need to put to the Minister uh, when we see him a little bit later on. But for now, thank you. Thank you. That brings this session to a conclusion. <laughs> thank you so much for your evidence. Thank you. Thank order, thank you. order. Thank you. The proceeding is currently suspended. 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 Order, order. Welcome to the third panel for this morning's Business and Trade Committee hearings on post office and post office compensation. 
Uh, our third panel uh, includes uh, representatives of the post office and Fujitsu. Could you just say a quick word of introduction and then we'll get into the questioning, Nick. Good morning, Chair. Yes, my name is Nick Reed. I'm the Group Chief Executive of the Post Office. And good morning, Chair. My name is Paul Patterson. I'm the Director of Fujitsu Services Limited here in the UK and CEO of Europe. Thank you. Um, Mr. Patterson, could I um, start with you, please? Would you say that Fujitsu is an ethical company? Firstly, if I may just comment on what I've just been listening to this morning, to the sub-postmasters and uh, their families. Uh, Fujitsu would like to apologise for our part in this appalling miscarriage of justice. We were involved from the very start. We did have bugs and errors in the system, and we did help the uh, post office in their prosecutions of the sub-postmasters. For that, we are truly sorry. To your question, Chair, around our ethics, I believe we are an ethical company. The company today is quite different to the company in the early 2000s, and clearly we need to demonstrate that both to our customers, to government, and to the wider society here in the well, UK. I've got in front of me, Mr Patterson, the Fujitsu Code of Conduct. It says, we treat customers, business partners, partners and competitors fairly and with respect. Did you live up to those values when it came to the sub-postmasters? No, we did not. It is very clear from the evidence before the committee and also in the uh, inquiry that our standards were not at the level that we adhere to and state as you've rightly read. Uh, I am personally appalled by the evidence that I have seen and uh, what I have uh, saw on the television drama and the uh, um, statements I've seen from the victims to the inquiry. So we did not stand up to that um, in those periods of time. And do you accept that Fujitsu evidence was used to put innocent people in prison? Yes, there was evidence from us. We did have a, um, we were supporting rather the post office in their prosecutions. Um, there was data given from us to them to support those prosecutions, so yes. Do you accept that before 2010, your staff knew that there were problems with the Horizon system? The information that was shared with the post office um, as part of our contract with them was very clear. So the post office also knew there were bugs and errors. They also but just to zero in on this, did staff in your organisation before 2010 know that there were problems with the Horizon system? So I believe that Sir Wynne... Simple so, yes or no? Well, I don't, I don't personally know, Chair. I think the inquiry is looking at that very point that you... What's just your made. gut feel? My gut feel would be yes. OK. So you've said that you're an ethical company. You've said that your evidence was used to put innocent people in prison. You've said that staff in your organisation knew that there were problems with the system. Can you tell us how much you now think your company should contribute to the compensation bill? The inquiry is dealing with some very complex matters over... But is there a moral obligation, Mr Patterson, for you to contribute? Uh, I think there is a moral obligation for the company to, uh, to contribute, and I think the right place to determine uh, that is when our, co uh, our responsibility is very clear. There are many parties involved in this um, travesty. But I've just uh, read your uh, last set of accounts which have been published. You've not made any provision in those accounts for a contribution to the compensation, but you're telling the committee today that you believe there is at least a moral obligation for Fujitsu to contribute. When the inquiry finishes... That's a simple yes or no. Well, so is there a moral obligation for Fujitsu I've already to answered... I already... It's OK, you can keep going. OK, sorry. Um, yes, I believe there is a moral obligation, and I've already, uh, I've already said that. I think it's also important that the inquiry deals with, these, deals with these very complex matters with all the parties involved. Yes, we have a part to play. Yes, the post office. Already this morning we've talked about lawyers, we've talked about the law. I think all of those matters need to be discovered to bring transparency and to bring the truth. And in that context, absolutely, we have a part to play and to contribute 
to the redress, I think is the words that Mr. Bates used, the redress fund for the sub postmasters. Thank you very much. Mr. Lavery. Thanks, uh, <coughs> thank you, Chair. Mr. Patterson, do you accept that the existence of a Fujitsu covert unit, as shown on the ITV documentary, actually existed whereby members of your team um, were able to access sub postmasters and computer systems in their own uh, offices? and were able to change data without sub-postmasters uh, knowing that that had been done? I don't recognise the term covert. Um, I wasn't there. At Did the it happen? Was that, was that happening? So we have already stated that there was remote access to these systems. Um, what took place or did not took place uh, in those interventions is certainly, I know, one of the streams of work that the, uh, that the inquiry are looking at as well. But there was fact, there was remote access. I mean, covert means in many ways secretly. If you've got people in your <coughs> offices or, or wherever accessing uh, remotely um, the sub postmasters uh, accounts and altering them, that's covert, isn't it? Um, so, so without the sub postmasters having any idea whatsoever that that happened, and in fact, it. it it would border on, I'm not a solicitor, but certainly would border being on illegal in my view. The support and the interventions from uh, remotely from Fujitsu um, has been documented and it is clear. The post office was certainly aware of that remote access and that was clear for some period of time. The post office denied that, didn't it? I believe they did. So the post office weren't telling the truth at the time. Is that, is I that just know what I. So I only know what I know, and I know that it certainly as part of that process, the remote access was documented and communicated. What do you say to that, Mr. Reid? That the post office were very much aware but denied it. Um, I, I've only been in the organisation since 2019, so it's difficult for me to comment. I, I think the most. Got a comment on the post well, office? You're in charge of the post office. I think I think the most important place for the commentary is going to be. Uh, Sir Wynne Williams's inquiry, we are obviously cooperating with him wholeheartedly to make sure that all information that we have and that we are aware of is supplied to that inquiry. And clearly there will be individuals from the post office who will be providing um, witness statements and who will be coming forward to give insight into that. I mean, there's whistleblowers um, have, have come forward and, and said that undoubtedly there was uh, problems with the Fujitsu system, the Horizon system. Um, why did Fujitsu or the post office just sit back and take absolutely no notice of the sub postmasters rather than listen to them and try and help them and get, uh, get the issues resolved amicably, basically took the attitude that you're just going to prosecute these people uh, and, and basically um, they were feared for the, the livelihoods, so much actually committed suicide as a result of the post office policy. Why was this a case? Well, I, as I say, I can't um, answer for specifically for what was happening pre-2015. I, I simply wasn't in the business at the time. What I can empathise with is that I've spent um, a lot of this last year speaking individually to postmasters who are victims of uh, the scandal. Um, and uh, I, I've had private meetings with over 30 of those, and a number of them have certainly talked to me about the trauma associated uh, with this, uh, the way that they were treated and handled. And I, I think that is something that's come through in the human evidence uh, that has been displayed at the inquiry, uh, and, and also that has come through very, very clearly uh, in the way that they were treated. And, and clearly, from our perspective, we want to make sure that we as an organisation um, are giving Sawin every single opportunity that he has uh, to make sure that he can get to the truth. And that is clearly what the... We would expect nothing less. Absolutely agree with you, Chair. That is exactly what we need to do. Um, we know it's an extremely complex uh, situation. It's been going on for 25 years. Uh, there's an enormous amount of documentation and data, but we want to make sure that we give him every opportunity to understand what exactly happened, who was accountable, and, and indeed what we do next. What, what happened to um, Joe Hamilton and others 
money to they paid repaid what happened to that well i've obviously become aware as a consequence of the uh, the evidence that's been provided that there is a uh, an on-running issue associated with suspense accounts. Uh, we've had this investigated two or three times by external agencies. We've provided that data to Sir Wynne. He can obviously make his can draw his conclusion specifically. I don't think we, as, as I understand it, that we got to the bottom and the nub of what was going on with those suspense accounts. Lord Abuthnot spoke to me about this when I first joined the organisation in 2020, and it's something that we've struggled to uncover because the quality of the data isn't good enough going back over 10 years, to be honest. Um, but it is, as I say, something that we've spoken to our auditors about. It's something that we had uh, external third party look at, uh, certainly prior to my time, <coughs> and it's something that, that Second Sight obviously called out. So we, we have provided that information to Sir Wynne. He will be able to draw his conclusions, given all the evidence that he is gathering. Uh, and we will, as I say, get to the bottom of exactly what happened. Um, and this is obviously pre-2015. Is it a possibility that the money is that the so postmaster has paid and it opened the, the coffers of the post office and then as part of the profits the, the, the monies were then paid to dividend holders and indeed could have been part of uh, hefty hold on, hefty numeration packages for the the post office um, executive. It's difficult to say. I mean, I, I, as I say, why, this, why this, is is, this is pre-2015. I don't have the context of what the but is it possible? Practice. I mean, I it's mean, possible. Of course, it's, it's possible. possible. Absolutely, it's possible. Mr. Snare, Patterson, why, why at the time you know you knew that there was glitches in the system? Why did you sit back and do absolutely nothing about it? I don't know. I really don't know. And um, on a personal level, I wish I did know. Um, following my appointment in 2019. I've looked back on those situations for the company and the evidence I've seen, and I just don't know. What I do know is the inquiry is looking at this very point of who knew what and when, and what action they did or did not take to draw attention to, to, uh, to the concerns. I just don't know. Mr. Reid, in, um, in, I think it was 2015, the post office executive Paula Venels told the committee that she believed that the prosecutions were sound. I mean, things have changed dramatically, obviously. Do you think the post office attempted to mislead Parliament uh, and the public uh, to cover up its own feelings? I, I, but I can't specifically comment on that. I think what's become very evident, clearly, is that we've got a number of um, of cases that have come to light. We've seen 2,500 colleagues come forward in the Horizon shortfall scheme. We've seen a number of overturned convictions. Uh, clearly, Sir Wynne will be looking very carefully at what has happened. Um, and I think uh, you know, we're all very keen to get to the bottom of this. I, I've been very, very clear since I joined the organization that the post office simply can't move forward until such time as proper address um, has been uh, determined and has, more importantly, has been paid out and given to those victims of this scandal. We know that. Um, and you know, certainly from our perspective, we will provide everything we can to Sir Wynne so that he can make these pronouncements. Uh, I know it's a frustration for the committee that, you know, certainly in, in my instance, I wasn't in the organisation and you would like specific answers. It's very difficult to do that. but. Well, we would expect two, you to know the history given in the two full cooperation with the inquiry, <coughs> Mr Reid. Well, absolutely, and, and that is exactly what we're doing. We are providing all and full cooperation with the inquiry, and that's clearly the right place for us to apportion blame when Sir Wynne has made his pronouncements. That's very, very clear, um, and uh, we want to make sure that he does that and does that well. Jack, can I just, just say, uh, um, I've asked three or four questions. I haven't had one answer. Uh, yet, and uh, um, the, the reality is, you've got the head of the post office, head of Fujitsu, the, the, that department, and the, the the answers have been absolutely negative. You know, if we bring in people in front of the committee, we would expect them at least uh, to have a knowledge of the history of what's happened. Something as big as this, and the, the answers have been uh, well. We haven't, I haven't had any answers to the questions. Uh, which I've asked, and I'm extremely, I'm not frustrated, I'm absolutely appalled at the, the answers which I've received. Thanks. Mr. Gullis, briefly. 
Thank you, Chair. Mr Patterson, can you tell me when specifically management in Fujitsu, ideally the month and the year, knew about yeah. the Horizon system being faulty? I can't answer a month and a year um, to your question. Not even well, a year? Well, well, Because I'm assuming you said at the beginning to the Chair that there were issues with the system. So is it that there were issues with the system from day one? Or is it something that was discovered later on? Because as reported in the eye this month, near identical, I use a quote there, errors were found in an earlier post office IT project supplied by a subsidiary of Fujitsu, ICL Pathway, which was in 1999. So I ask again, when were management aware? And if you're unable to answer now, will you commit to asking executives to formally write to the chair of the committee to provide that detail? I'll say two things. First of all, there were known bugs and errors in the system at a very early stage. You asked me the month and year, I can't give you the month and year, but from the very start, there were bugs and errors in the system. We have a... Uh, we have a Why did this earlier project fail? Why was the trial of the system showed errors in ICL pathway, which could have led to potentially thousands of sub-postmasters being projected? Why was this earlier system which is near identical to Horizon, why was that flashing up errors? So I don't know what was happening in 1995 to 1999. What I do know is that there were bugs and errors in the system when it rolled out. In any large IT project, there will always be some bugs and errors in any system, particularly of this scale. The important thing is, what do we do with that information? Do we take that information and share it with the post office? Yes, we did. How the post office then chose to use that information in their prosecutions is entirely on the post office's side. So you accept but there, there were faults with the system, yeah. Mr. Patterson, but, and you say you pass it on to the post office and basically pass the buck from what I just heard there, but to quote your own marketing material, the most advanced and secure electronic banking and retail network in Europe when describing the Horizon system. So your own communications to sell your own product around the world you were using Horizon as a great example, yet you're saying here now that errors were known and how fun. So when was the first error, again, month and year, passed to the post office? So I can't tell you month and year. So will I you can... commit to writing to this committee to tell us when? So I know that Sir Wynn, this is one of the phases of the investigation with Sir Wynn, particularly about when the systems rolled out, the training for the sub-postmasters, etc. So I can, I can commit to the Chair that I will re revert back into what we have already submitted to the <coughs> inquiry in this area. It was an area that was discussed early on. And quite remarkable, we don't know when. Okay, but let's go to the point now about the Horizon system. David McDonnell told the inquiry, who was part of the Horizon development team, and I quote again, of eight people in the development team, two were very good, another two were mediocre, but we could work with them. And then there was probably three or four who just went up to it and weren't capable of reducing professional code. My stepfather spent his entire professional life writing code for many different IT firms. So it's quite worrying that half, well actually two thirds of your team are incapable. Out of the current Horizon development team, are they very good, mediocre or incapable? So the current Horizon system is very different to the old system. The, I do not believe we have got software development taking place today. The system is in and it's just been operated. It has not been developed. Can I ask, Mr. Reid said he's now met 30 sub-postmasters and postmistresses. How many have Fujitsu executives or yourself met? I have not met any sub-postmasters physically. And has any Fujitsu executive met any of the victims? I, am un I do not know, Ms. Gills. Why has Fujitsu decided not to meet victims? I have not, not decided to meet the victims. I have, I have personally watched the drama on TV and read the evidence that was given in the impact statements by sub-postmasters and I've also watched some of the YouTube videos of it. Can I ask, why has it taken an ITV drama to inspire Fujitsu to sort of become much more forthcoming? Why is it Fujitsu did not decide to go out and reach out? I think they had legal representatives who would have been happy, I'm sure, put people in contact. Why are Fujitsu executives happy to not meet when actually to the post office have only just at least started, but at least they're doing it? Why is it Fujitsu feel they're above that? I certainly don't feel that I'm personally above that, and I don't believe that the company feels that they're above that either. What I do believe is that we need to get to the bottom of the entire truth 
and make sure that truth is transparent and we don't just jump to a particular soundbite. And what's Fujitsu's position on the proposed emergency legislation? Do you think the prison sentences are appropriate or inappropriate for those who have been declared guilty to date? I have no expertise to determine what the government or the parliament, the, I have no expertise on. Will Fujitsu give its full support to all victims to have their uh, convictions quashed? We, we have, I will say two things on this topic. Since my appointment, I have been absolutely steadfast in our support for the inquiry and any information that a sub postmaster needs of Mr. Fujitsu. Patterson, I'm not talking about the inquiry, I'm talking about legislation that we're hearing about coming before the House in a matter of weeks. Will Fujitsu support what the government intends to do? and to quash the convictions of those who have been wrongfully convicted in the largest miscarriage of justice this country has faced. It is the an appalling situation, and we will do, while I am in this role, I will do everything I can to make sure any information that Surely we need to give... Surely it's a simple thing. Will Fujitsu support the government in quashing these uh, convictions? Do Fujitsu accept that everyone who, under this scheme, should, fate, should, not have, should have their convictions overturned? Um, it is very clear from the inquiry the answer would be yes. Mr. Reid, out of interest, the post office shared that view. I'm assuming we do. We've we've um, we're very clear that we want to ensure that redress um, is done as quickly as possible, and the um, the scheme of the mass exoneration that the that the minister has put forward, uh, we welcome that. And the final question for me, sorry, very quickly, Chair. Can I just ask, Mr. Reid, have the post office hired any public relations companies to handle this crisis after the drama came to air? And if so. How much is the post office paying for that advice? No, we haven't. Thank you. Can I just check a couple of points on the timeline then? So we have a report in the Times today about a whistleblower from the post office uh, who says that <coughs> as early as 2001, uh, it quotes, you could go into their cash and adjust it or wipe their cash off completely. You could go into their stock declaration, add stamps and so on. In, in a sense, we've got evidence here of, in 2001, a member of post office staff acknowledging that remote access to the terminals is possible. We then have, from 2013, tapes that show the post office company secretary preparing to brief Paula Venels uh, about whether remote access to Horizon accounts was possible. Uh, we then have the Clark advice in 2013 warning that a former Fujitsu Horizon architect uh, had given incorrect evidence to courts pertaining to remote access. I just want to check, Mr. Reid, from your point of view, when do you think post office staff first knew that remote access to Horizon terminals was possible? I couldn't give you an exact date on that. Why can um, you not answer that question? It is fundamental to this case. What is, fun yeah, what is, what is fundamental for our, from our perspective is we are facilitating so we're getting to the bottom of all of these issues. That you, must how long be have you the been right the chief point. executive now? Because coming into the organisation... How long have you been the chief executive now? Four years. You must surely have had time in four years to cut to the heart of this issue, which is when did the post office know remote access to terminals was possible? My, my, my role certainly coming into, into the post office is to do a number of things. Of course it is to speed up as much as we can and as quickly as we can the compensation that's being paid. That must be the right start Surely point. you that must be, be telling Sir Wynne's inquiry when somebody in the post office knew that remote access to terminals was possible. We will be, we will be providing Sir Wynne with all the information that he requires. But what's the answer? I haven't got that specific date. I can come back to you with what we have supplied in, in the same way as Mr. Patterson has described um, that we will come back to you. I can do the same. I think we are both surprised and disappointed that you've not got that question answered on the table. Yeah. Mr. Paws. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I share your concern about Mr. Reid's um, lack of uh, opinion about what was happening in the post office prior to him joining four years ago. Mr. Reid, you yes. joined with a pretty stellar career in the retail sector. You'd worked for many big companies and you've got a, a very broad business experience. Um, as the business committee, we're concerned about the performance and practice, and including the ethics of uh, businesses in the UK. How would you describe uh, the practice and ethics of the post office in the period before you joined it, perhaps from the period from 2000 uh, to you joining in, in 2019? I think when I joined in 2019, what struck me about the organisation <coughs> was that it was in shock and paralysis as a consequence. It was in shock paralysis, paralysis. paralysis. as a yeah. consequence of the 
common issues judgment and horizons issues judgment. That would be my, f my first observation. Um, and, and I think <coughs> certainly from my perspective, uh, trying to address that culturally was extremely important and that's what, what we spent, or what I have spent my time trying to do. And indeed that's why we, uh, we obviously settled with the GLO almost immediately after I had joined uh, the business. And I think part of the challenge that uh, that I have found clearly is, and as you'll be, you'll be fully aware, uh, this scandal has gone on for a very long time, 25 years, and obviously there are, uh, is a mindset that needs to be changed for people to understand just exactly what has happened, which is why it's important that senior executives in my team go out and uh, meet with the victims and that they see what has occurred, because I think to your point, culturally trying to understand what is going on in our business, um, people need to see and feel what has happened to some of these Was victims. the existence of this issue then, Mr Reid, dominating all thoughts that you and your senior management team had about the nature of the business that you were being asked to manage? I don't think it was dominating everything in 2019 when I joined, no. It was an insignificant part. No, I wouldn't say it was insignificant, but I think to your point, I don't think it was dominating everything, right. and that's why... It was, it is, and well, it was so important to change that. Do you, you've heard, you've sat throughout the evidence uh, already today, and did you hear Lord Abuthnot when talking about the unequal relationship that exists between postmasters and the post office yes. itself? He spoke about the post office as being this most trusted brand. Yes. Was it a most trusted brand then, and is it a most trusted brand now? I think his principle was absolutely right, which is it's not the corporate entity that is trusted, it's the relationship between customers and their local postmasters. That is what, that is what, that is what the brand is, and I think we need to... So you recognise the I value of the postmaster I, in the I, way that Lord Abuthnot described? Absolutely do. The, the post office is the postmaster. Right. So, what, so why did one of these people who's been delivering your most trusted brand, Joe Hamilton, say that when she was being, uh, inquiries were being made of uh, the reconciliation with no branch, she felt as though a financial gun was being held to her head. I mean, it's appalling, uh, is, the, uh, is the obvious comment that I would make. And I have enormous empathy for what Joe went through. And I have to say that, you know, we've all listened to what has occurred in the inquiry and the evidence gathering that has occurred in the inquiry, as well as the evidence that's been provided uh, by former colleagues. And it's appalling. Uh, there's We've no also heard today that. that there was a belief that the motive of the investigators, where uh, something was identified uh, as a failure, uh, uh, some, some missing happens in all sorts of businesses, in all sorts of accounts, as yep. you were well know, but that the motive of the investigators was that of asset recovery rather than trying to identify what might have happened. How can that be the attitude deeply of concerning. a most trusted brand? Deeply concerning. I agree with you entirely. It is deeply concerning. Do you which accept is why that characterisation which, which of the I, investigators? Well, I, I think we've heard, we've heard evidence uh, in the inquiry to that, to that point. And so you know, that is what has been provided. So I think it's very, it's very clear to me that there is a reason why we've not prosecuted anybody in the post office, certainly not under my watch and certainly not before 2015, and we have no intention of doing so. Uh, and I think culturally we've got a long, long, long way to go to ensure that actually we put our postmasters first. To your point, they are the brand. The postmasters are the brand. The relationship between postmasters and their customers is what matters. And certainly we at the corporate entity need to recognise that we are here to serve those postmasters. Right, and we've heard this issue described as the largest miscarriage of justice in British legal history, but more importantly, for you as somebody running a business, uh, a, li a one billion liability against, against the post office. Do you recognise that sum, and what provision have you made for it in your accounts? Sorry, be the question again, the one, the one billion liability being you, what? The erosion of... With the, the liability on the post office of, of this matter being a billion pounds. What, what provision... Have you made for it? Well, I think... Do you accept the figure, first of all? No, I don't really accept the figure. I, I, well, what is I, the figure? I think, I think where we've, we've obviously, uh, and you'll see in our report and accounts that were published at the end of last year, um, we, like uh, Mr Bates mentioned today, have been concerned that people are not coming forward. So the funding has been provided by government for 
uh, to, to address the compensation issues, but we are still struggling to get people to come forward, and that is a problem for us, what which is you, why it's reduced because You're running a business. You've got yep. this liability. What's your assessment of the extent of the liability as we sit here today? Well, as I say, we reduced our, um, we reduced our provisions because people were not coming forward. Uh, to, to, to sort of claim compensation. Which what, what's your assessment of the figure, Mr. Reid? Well, I think what has been done in the last 10 days in terms of the potential um, to mass exonerate, and th that is going to obviously generate a lot more people coming forward. And so I think that scale of the oh, size is the, of the problem is the is going billion to pounds we heard from Lord Arbuthnot. I think it's unlikely. To be realistic. I think it's unlikely to be that, but to be that size, but it may well be. Uh, it, it could, it, it could, could be, be a billion pounds. It may well be. All right. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr. Thank you. Mr. Reed, when you took over in 2019, the post office was already engaged in substantial civil litigation. Yes, brought by the post office. So you, as chief executive, would have wanted to bring yourself fully up to speed with the background of that. I'm sure. Having done that, uh, can you help us uh, as to why it was nobody in the post office, as I've seen, ever queried why there'd been sudden, such a sudden uptick in the number of prosecutions of your postmasters? Mm -hmm. That never, the question never seems to be asked. Can you help the, as to why? As in the the number of uh, prosecutions from, from the in, yes. from the introduction of Horizon yes. right the way through. Um, my assessment of the pre-Horizon is that there were as many prosecutions. Um, you pre -horizon. That you can provide. S say again. Uh, we will provide you that data. If you could do that, yes, that I will. would be most helpful. Yeah. Uh, but to, to your point, yes. nonetheless. What astonishes me when I look back to 2019 through to 2015 is that there are between 55 and 75 prosecutions approximately every single year. It is an extraordinary number. Yes. Don't get me wrong. It is an absolutely extraordinary number that that kind of or that lack of curiosity uh, for individuals saying, why is this the case? What is going on is uh, something that remains a mystery. And I'm sure that, as I say, that Sir Wynne will understand from those who were involved uh, quite precisely why that was the case and what happened. Horizon was also, I think, used in the Crown Post offices, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yeah. Have it, has any investigation been done as to what happened there in terms of discrepancies? Well, in terms of discrepancies, yeah, yeah. Um, more specifically, or what, what, uh, over a particular I mean, time I, period? Was anybody prosecuted who was an employee of a Crown Post office? Uh, I'm not 100% certain. Were deficiencies found in Crown Post offices? Can you help me? I, I, did. I, I haven't got that detail. Perhaps you could try and I research will. it and provide it. You can see that you um, are, are not now undertaking private prosecutions. Correct. Do you accept, because of the failures, as things stand, I hope the post office is unfit as an organisation to carry out private prosecutions? I, I don't think the post office would want to carry out private prosecutions. Um, and I've been very clear that on my watch they won't, uh, and I see no reason why they should continue to do so. M Mr. Mr. Patterson, the post office in, in carrying out those prosecutions submitted witness statements by their investigators which attested to the uh, robustness of, of the Horizon system. One assumes, from the evidence that we've heard, that they must have uh, uh, had uh, information from your company, from Fujitsu, to suggest that it was robust. What do you say to the prospect that actually inaccurate information provided by your company led to wrongful prosecutions of people who were subsequently imprisoned? That's a scandal, isn't it? That's exactly one of the topics that the inquiry is looking at. Exactly that topic about what evidence was given to the post office from Fujitsu to support the inquiry, uh, to support the prosecutions. I said in my opening point that we did support the post office in those prosecutions, and we did give that, and we did give them information to do that. If that was done, subject to the outcome of the inquiry, there's a moral obligation and perhaps a financial obligation on, on Fujitsu for what happened there. As I've already said, we do see, to, to the Chair's first question, we do see a moral obligation, but we also see, with the entire end-to-end -end of all the components in this, to get to the truth. And it's the truth. You were already discussing this morning about disclosure, you know, how that information was given to the post up and whether that was disclosed. These are complicated matters, and so we is rightly examining those. And to the Chair's question to me earlier, when that is done, we also expect to sit down with government to determine our contribution to that redress, or compensation, as you said. You'll make provision accordingly. So, I, I have, to the earlier question, we have not made provision for that yet, and, and I, I, can, I can't put a number on that yet. 
But when we've got to that position, we absolutely would need to make a provision for it. Of course we would. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Reid, when you came into post in 2019, were you presented with the board minutes that go all the way back to when uh, this issue first started? So let's say 1999. Were you presented with a timeline? Yeah, it wasn't. That, so there has been, since your appointment, you have not gone through the board minutes at any point over the last 25 years? Many of them I have, but not all of them. I wasn't presented. I mean, the way you're characterising it is, was a pact sort of delivered to me. No. Um, clearly, we spent uh, a lot of time in 2020 as a board uh, working through um, the issues associated with uh, some of the human impact and obviously some of the individuals that, that, uh, that were involved. Could you then provide a date? I mean, we've had this question already. I don't want to repeat what colleagues have asked, but could you provide a date in which this is first raised? Your board minutes would presumably reflect that. And if you can't do it now, will you come back and report that to this committee? Um, you also said that senior executives go out uh, to meet with postmasters and mistresses. I'm not entirely sure why any of them would want to see you um, at this point. But we've heard from the opening remarks of the chair about the moral obligation. As far as I can understand it, you're sitting in front of us saying that you want to help. You led the prosecutions against people who were wrongly accused of doing things. And yet the Horizon Compensation Advisory Board is saying that you are responsible for the delay because much of the evidence has been lost or destroyed by the post office. So you led the prosecutions and now trying to even overturn these convictions is being hampered by the fact that you, your organization, has lost the information that could give people the justice that they seek. Could you just comment on that? I, th I think it's been well documented uh, in the inquiry that the uh, the challenge uh, within our organization of data and the protection of data over the last 20 years has been pretty poor. Uh, we have uh, wrestled, uh, I think probably with the best way to describe it, over the last two or three years to make sure that we provide as much data as possible. We have 60 million different documents that we provided to the inquiry. We've been through 500,000 uh, individual documents that we've actually supplied. Um, sorry, that we've actually had to, to, to go through. We've supplied over 120,000 specific documents. So this is a, it's an extremely complex beast, and I don't think anybody would be surprised, uh, ha having listened to the evidence uh, just from today, that over the last 25 years, it is going to be extremely complicated to get hold of all of this data and all of this documentation. But be assured, we fully recognize that we need to do that. Um, it is extremely important. Uh, if, if I may, just to comment on your question about would postmasters want to see senior executives, mm. this is an offer. We don't go and present ourselves. What, How many what have I've, taken it up? What, I've, what I've said to 45 have so far, what I've said to victims uh, is, and I've been very explicit about this over the last couple of years, that if there is an opportunity for any form of redress, is there some form of justice, some form of apology that I can do on a personal level, I'm very, very willing to do it. I think we've heard from... Alan and from Joe today that the trauma, and I use the word advisedly, the trauma that individuals have experienced can, in certain instances, be at least uh, reduced or slightly reduced when they have an opportunity to speak to the head of the organization that ultimately may well have been responsible for what they, uh, what they have been through. That trauma can be alleviated by you streamlining the system, making it less bureaucratic. And what we've heard from Joe, what we've heard from Alan, is that you feed into a system. You even heard it from uh, uh, the, the first panel, where the face-to-face -face <coughs> engagement is very good, but the bureaucratic system behind it is an absolute disaster. Are you committing here and now to saying that you will go away, both of you, as you know, in particular you, Mr. Reid, that you yes. will go away and make the changes necessary to make sure that the bureaucratic process is sped up to be made more efficient to make sure that these we, issues we, are resolved. We will, we will work with government to make sure that if it's an evidential level that needs to be dropped, if it's um, interim payments that need to be made permanent, w whatever it takes okay. to do that, and we will work with officials to make sure that we get the right guidance. The to proof them. will be in the action rather than of the words, but I take that point. And um, just lastly, why are you still using the Horizon system? I, I understand 2015 IBM was looked at. I understand Correct. recently Amazon was looked at. Correct. Are you simply using them because no one else can do it? Um, or no. are, you, are you just failing to actually innovate and look at new suppliers? Not, not at all, no. Um, I'm committed to get off Horizon, and um, uh, I've had that conversation um, you know, regularly with Mr. Patterson, and we are both committed to make sure that there is a, a new and upgraded system. We've talked about it before. It's outdated, it's clunky, it's old, but it's 25 years old. 
but it does what it's meant to do in terms of the job that it does today. But we're very clear that we need a modern system for a modern post office, and we will be getting off horizon, and that is, um, that is our intent. Uh, Mr. Patterson, um, is there any horizon programming code in any of your other systems? No. No. Um, do you feel that you should be paying back the money for the horizon system, given the damage that it has caused? from that government contract, do you think you should be reimbursing it, even to direct it towards a compensation scheme? So as a, the, the complicated topics, the inquiry is looking into those topics. I've already committed to this, to, to this uh, select committee that we will take the advice from, from, from uh, Sir Wynne and look to compensate, you used the word morally. I also think it is a moral, moral point and we will look to compensate, look to contribute to the redress or compensation scheme a little bit about months. With that last point to Mr. Bagnall was saying, again, this whole idea of contribute, how much of a contribution have you, as an organisation, estimated today that you think you need to pay? I have not got any estimate at all. I do not presume to calculate that. I think it's right and proper <coughs> that we allow the inquiry to discover where the responsibility lies, and responsibility lies in many places, but, and also inside Fujitsu. Will Fujitsu be bidding for other government contracts whilst the inquiry is going on? Does Fujitsu think it should withdraw itself from bidding for government contracts until the inquiry has been heard and Fujitsu's culpability is uh, decided? We provide many services to government today um, across a range of services. We have regular conversations with the department and the cabinet office about our performance. Um, going forward to your specific question, um, we will look at every opportunity and determine whether we bid for it in the open market or not. It is very clear that our brand and our uh, value in the UK and to government is under question and we will look at all of those opportunities and decide yes or no. Because Fujitsu has benefited from, what, £95 million in contract extensions to continue operating the flawed Horizon IT system. So will it volunteer today to compensate the victims arising using that 95 million related to what Mr Magnall was asking earlier? I've already answered that question, which is we will contribute to the compensation fund or the redress fund when it's very clear. I don't, I do not want to run this system. Mr Reid, you appeared before the committee to discuss Mr Lavery's earlier point in January 2022 and told us the victims' payments to make up the shortfalls, much of which came from life savings, people remortgaging, their properties was put into a the general suspense accounts on which the post office did not hold records beyond 2005. Why would the post office not track money? I thought that's quite an important thing for the post office. To I do. agree with you, and uh, it's something that we need to get to the bottom of. As, as I said, there were, to my understanding, two reviews that happened between 2015 and 2019, trying to understand exactly what the outcomes of the suspense accounts were. I think it's inconclusive, um, and I think it's it's frustrating. How regularly is it that the post office does not track money within its company? Well, clearly that's something that we do regularly now. I mean, we are running a business today, and clearly what was um, it not a business back then? <coughs> before was it not a business say, back I, then? I, I can't comment on the specifics of what was happening over ten years ago, but certainly from my perspective, you can be you can be assured that the protocols and controls have now been put in place. Uh, we have addressed all the issues that were part of the 2019 Common Issues Judgment and the Horizons Issue Judgment, the recommendations that were made by Fraser say that actually the system, as Mr. Patterson has remarked, is stable, is clunky, sure, but it is stable and it does the job that it does. And we've been involving our postmasters uh, in those solutions to make sure that actually it is doing the job that postmasters needed to do today. But we are very, very clear that we can uh, upgrade that system, which is why we are intending to get off Horizon and move to a new system. Any executives, directors on the board who were present at the time, who were then informed, as we will hopefully hear from yourself, Mr Reid, regarding the board minutes about this system and yet continue the facade that something, everything was fine, <coughs> are they unfit to hold directorships in any company, both public and private? Do anyone, any of the individuals in the post office, the senior executives on the mm -hmm. board, should they ever be allowed to sit on any board of any company if they were aware and yet did not come forward and did not seek to address this issue at the time? Are they fit?
for those directorships, which will come with whopping salaries and whopping uh, p uh, bonuses in any company. Well, if evidence is produced that there was some form of cover-up, then clearly action needs to be taken. Okay. Even those who sat there and were told that things were going wrong, and yet private prosecutions were still allowed to go ahead. Well, that's exactly what I just said. So I think if there is a if there's a situation where there is um, uh, you know, culpability, then clearly people will need to be held to account. And will you be allowed to let the committee finally, sorry, Chair, know when Fujitsu first raised concerns with the system with the post office? Again, I'm assuming that would have been brought to the board's attention. Well, we'll, I will, as I say, we will look into that and come back to you, Mr. Gullis. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Labour, and then Anthony. Just, just, just very briefly, what has the post office done, uh, Mr. Reid, to um, reach out to those uh, so postmasters who haven't yet come forward? Um, and, and I think from what's been said this morning, a lot of people are extremely concerned and frightened to do so. Uh, I, I, I presume that you have got the information, you have got their details because you've recovered monies from most of them and others have been prosecuted as a result of the post office. What are you doing to reach out and can you so give a commitment that you're actually going to reach out with these people? Uh, absolutely. I think one of, the, one of the challenges that we have, as you re recall from the last time that I appeared here, was that there was a real reluctance for postmasters to come forward to the post office. I think the, uh, the notion that the post office were the individuals that they would have to come and appeal to for any losses was a problem. And we, we, we sat here in this committee room and we, des we described how we were going to set up a scheme where the CCRC would contact postmasters directly and we provided them with that detail. We gave a package to the citizens advice so that they could do the same and also MPs so that they could contact postmasters specifically. What has happened as a consequence of the drama, and I think uh, Mr. Hudgel made this observation, is that some 200 postmasters have come forward. We've had 31 who've come directly to us as a consequence of the, um, uh, of the drama, so that is good. I mean, the, the, the raising awareness is a good thing in the sense that it's bringing people forward. However, um, I think as we've said before, one shouldn't just assume that the uh, the, the, the drama in itself is going to bring people forward. We want to continue, and we continue to do so. But you, you won't be surprised that many postmasters tell us not to contact them, not to continue continually saying, you know, you're trying to get us to come forward or, or uh, you know, um, present to us situations where we may have had losses or shortfalls. But a lot of postmasters simply want to move on, um, a lot of these victims. And that's a desperately concerning situation for us is, people need redress and people as I said mentioned before are having trauma and it's something that um, I've had first-hand experience of, of observing and indeed I was in this building yesterday with an MP and with a victim of this of the uh, of the scandal and, and she was mentioning or saying to me that the reliving of the last 10 days because of the enormous amount of publicity has been extremely stressful and traumatizing for many of those victims and I think we need to recognise that it's that that is something that is going on at the moment, and clearly wanting us to move through and accelerate through the redress is the most important thing that we can do. I think the the, the basically the excuse of not getting in touch with so postmasters because they want to move on um, is extremely shallow. It I is, think it's, it's, it's extremely not, important that you reach out to every single person who you've got on record uh, who ever had monies uh, recovered. Uh, and we've definitely been prosecuted, done uh, regardless, and I think that's a duty which the post office agree. should do, uh, carry out. Thank you. Anthony Hiddick, welcome. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Reid, you joined the post office in 2015. 2019. 2019. But you've reviewed board minutes going back beyond that point. Yeah, so, certainly specific ones, yeah. So I know you can't give us a, an exact date, a month mm. or a year, when you first saw Horizon referenced in any kind of board paper but would you does it uh, do you have a recollection that at some point before 2015 there was a reference to horizons and possible issues you must have a vague recollection having reviewed all that documents of whether horizon was even mentioned I'm not asking for a date yep. but pre 2015 was there any mention of possible issues with horizon in the board minutes? In any documents that you've seen? In documents that I've seen, yes, that we have submitted to Sewin, yes, we've done. So in 2015, when one of your predecessors, Paul of Endons, told this committee that prosecutions were sound, was Parliament misled? I 
don't know if I can specifically comment on that. I think what's what's clearly occurred in the you're under ev- parliamentary ev- privilege. What, so what's, what's clearly occurred in the evidence the that has been provided to the inquiry and what we've seen and what we've heard is that um, individuals who've been prosecuted uh, and those individuals that go all the way back have been prosecuted on the basis of. Uh, of information of information that may be erroneous. Yes, that is, I think, something that we've heard in the uh, we've heard in the. Well, from, well, hold on, but from the information you've seen, would you have said to this committee that all prosecutions were sound in 2015, having seen what you've now seen? I don't think I can give you a straight answer on that because there's so much more context. I think that's required. As I say, we've been very, very, very clear that Sir Wynne is going to get to the bottom of these details, and that is what we think is the right thing to do. I don't think it's my place to prejudge that. He spent two and a half years doing it. Do you think the culture in the post it. office at the time, back in 2015, when your predecessor, Paula Mills, came to Parliament, do you think the culture in the post office at the time was to cover up failings, to protect I can't, the brand? I, I can't comment on what I'm asking for your opinion. I, I, as I say, I, I, I'm, I think it's um, unreasonable for me to do that, given that... So having clear, read through clearly board honest. minutes and documents that would indicate to you that there was knowledge the system was unsound. You can't say that <coughs> it was wrong to say in 2015 all prosecutions were sound. Well, I think what, what has become apparent is all prosecutions weren't sound, and that is clearly what And so for someone to say that in 2015... W- whether or not that was a, 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 a pure knowledge, I, I can't comment, and I think we'll have to wait and see when those executives come before the inquiry. As I mentioned before, they will be coming before the inquiry in the next three months or so, and so people will be able to see and speak firsthand. They will be writing witness statements. They will be commenting on what they knew, what they didn't know, and so when we'll be able to Are build using the picture. inquiry as a way to, to not be curious, to, no, to try and avoid answering questions, or yourself getting under no, the not. bonnet of the issues at the time? No, I'm not. I'm, my, my job is to make sure that, as I said, that, that redress is speedily delivered to our victims, and most importantly, that I run the post office of today. That is my job. My job is not the investigative role that is being played by Sir Wynne. That is clearly his job. He's, um, he initiated an independent inquiry. It's now a statutory inquiry. I think it's appropriate that that is the forum in which... 25 years. That, that, that he uh, addresses things. Running the business. 25 years. Sorry. And you're running the business. Sorry, Anthony. Do you think the post office abused its position to prosecute in order to cover up its own failings? As I, say, I, I think it's unreasonable to ask these questions when the knowledge is going to be addressed in the inquiry specifically. That is, the individuals will be asked those but I'm questions. asking you, as the current chief executive, who has said you're not going to pursue we, we aren't, private prosecutions. We aren't so do you think you abused your position as an organisation in running prosecutions to cover up there was nothing unique about there was nothing u- unique about private prosecutions. Individuals and companies can bring private prosecutions. That is something that can occur. Um, do I think it was done uh, egregiously? I've listened, obviously, to the inquiry. I've listened to the details of many of the victims, and clearly there is an issue that needs to be addressed, and that is what is going to happen as we go through this process. What I'm asking is the person who leads the organisation today. You must have a view on why the prosecutions were being. Was it a culture of trying to cover up the organization's own failings because it had a lack of technical knowledge? Was it people so scared of their own lack of knowledge that they thought the easy option, rather than flag concerns up, was just to prosecute? I think there's, there's, there are many numbers of issues here that we can address. Is it the competency of the investigators? Is it the competency of the auditors? Is it the information that was being supplied? Is it the guidance that they were getting uh, and the oversight that they were receiving? Is it the asset collection? We've, we've talked about all of these things. There are multiple reasons why, and I think it's really important that we allow Sir Wynne to ask the individuals those questions so that he builds that picture. My job, and I'm being very clear, we're not prosecuting people within the post office. We have not brought private prosecutions within the post office. On my watch, that has not occurred, and it will not occur. We're very, very clear about that. My job is not to go back and investigate what happened in the organisation pre-2015, pre-2010. I can see that's immensely frustrating for you, but my job today is to run the post office today to make sure that we have a post office that is fit for purpose, and more importantly, that we have postmasters in the, who can go about doing the job they want to do free of fear of any kind of relationship that they may have had in 2015 and before.
It's, it's disappointing, Mr. Reid. It sounds like you are trying to suggest, because there is an inquiry ongoing, that you don't need to look back over the history. The inquiry will deal with all of that. But you're running the organisation today that has a culture yep. and a history. And yes, the post office may have changed, but it is the same organisation. It is the same organisation, I assume, with thousands of people who worked for it at the time all of this happened. And the fact that you're not willing to look under the bonnet and answer questions because the inquiry should look at it indicates a lack of corporate curiosity that I think is worrying. I, I, I would disagree with that. Um, characterization. I think it's very clear to me. I have some 1,700 colleagues who have been in the organization for more than 10 years, and I'm acutely conscious that my job is to make sure that the culture that we have today is to put our postmasters first. So there are a series of recommendations that came out of the 2019 findings by Judge Fraser, which we are absolutely implementing. And more importantly, my job is to create a culture where people are supporting and serving postmasters, and that is my role. My job is not to investigate going backwards. I don't think it's about addressing those issues. It's about making sure we have an organisation today that is fit for purpose. Okay, that's, so let me ask you a question the on most today. important thing. Does the post office still use non-disclosure agreements in reaching settlements with sub-postmasters? Not to my knowledge. So no non-disclosures have been requested or signed since you took over to as chief knowledge. executive? Would you check that and come I'll back? I'll do. Please? Um, Mr. Patterson, if I can just come to you briefly. Um, you said earlier that it was clear that there was bugs in the Horizon system. Were you aware, or was the organisation aware, that those bugs could generate major discrepancies in accounting? You know, we're not talking a system flickering or, or a minor bug. Was the organisation aware that the bugs were so material they could change the numbers? So I don't, I don't have evidence in front of me that connects a bug which was present to a shortfall. Could they make? Could it cause shortfalls? Yes, it could. And I said that in my opening statement. And I know that again is a subject for the inquiry to look at the detail to your point about scale. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether it's big or small, but I do know they could make a make an impact. And your view, having looked at the history, is that that was reported yes. to the post office. Um, I know you've also said that you've not made a provision yet. Have you had conversations with your head office in Japan about Horizon since you took over the role? Yes. And their view is the same, that they are willing to allow provision to be made once the yeah, number is arrived at? Yeah, yes, and the reason why I can say what I said earlier is because that is the conversation we expect on the conclusion to absolutely have that conversation about our contribution to the fund or redress or compensation. We expect to have that conversation with the relevant government. And that's the view across all of Fujitsu? Yes, it comments. is. Okay. Thank you. Really briefly, Mr. Gillis. Uh, Mr. Reid, you yes. talked about no longer using non-disclosure agreements. If any non-disclosure agreements were made in the past with former subpartisans and postmistresses who have since been convicted or came yeah. to agreements, would the post office not block those NDAs being broken so that wouldn't evidence could be broken? We, we wouldn't block those. And there'll be no recompense? We should, we should, that people should bring forward and say exactly what they need to say. Okay, thank you. Um, I just need to rattle through a few questions that we need uh, on the record, um, Mr. Reid. So have you seen any evidence that post office executives misled ministers at any stage? I've not seen any evidence. Have you seen any evidence that uh, post office executives misled the courts at any stage? I've not seen any evidence of that. Have you seen any evidence that post office ministers misled Parliament at any stage? No, I haven't. Do you believe that the post office prosecuted the innocent knowing the case to be flawed? I sincerely hope not, but I have not had evidence to that, that effect. Why do you think the post office fought the provision of compensation to those who were unfairly punished for so long? Why did they fight it, sorry? Yeah. The provision of compensation for so yeah. long. Exactly. Why yeah, has the post it's office it's dragged its feet it's for it's so long in providing compensation to those <coughs> who would you address? A cultural denial. I can only assume that that is the case. It's a lack of understanding and a, perhaps a lack of curiosity of really what is going on. And I think that is the most important cultural challenge that, that I have in my organisation is to ensure that everybody in the organisation sees and understands absolutely what has been going on 
And I don't think that was the case, certainly when I joined in 2019. Are you cooperating in full with the inquiry? Absolutely. Because there has been some press reports there has. that people have not been working overtime or at the weekends in order to provide the evidence the inquiry I can, requires. I can assure you we are working uh, extremely hard to make sure that the inquiry has everything it needs to come to the conclusions it needs to come to about what went wrong, why it went wrong, and more importantly, who was responsible. Uh, there is nothing to be gained reputationally for the post office or indeed anybody in my organisation to drag their feet at all. The only way that the post office can move forward is by ensuring that the inquiry has what it needs <coughs> to draw its conclusions and more importantly that redresses. In your last problems. accounts, did you offset a provision for compensation against the tax that you <coughs> paid to the Exchequer? No, and it's important that we... we, we we do make this observation. There was a characterization, I think, that bonuses have been somehow inflated as a consequence of the treatment of tax and the treatment of compensation. Let me assure you right now that that is absolutely not the case. Uh, we have not done that at all. Um, the tax treatment that we have for compensation, we are, as uh, it states very clearly in the, in the report and accounts, we are having those conversations with HMRC. I indeed wrote to um, uh, the Chief Secretary of the Treasury about 18 months ago to discuss this exact topic about how do we um, how do we treat the, the compensation payments and indeed how we treat the payments of those. So that is so, that so is the a bonuses and the tax were calculated off the same. Bonuses line. were not. Bonuses have nothing to do at all with tax treatment. With the only the only no, financial. No, the, qu the question is whether bonuses and tax were calculated off the same profit line. No, they were. They were calculated on two different profit lines. We. Um, the, the bonus for um, the financial metric associated with the bonus was on a trading profit as opposed to on a compensation line or indeed a, it was a pre-tax, not a post-tax line. So you see the concern I can see you've the basically concern. been underpaying your taxes and overpaying I can, I can your see, I can see where the concern is, but I can assure you that is not the case. But you've just said it is the case because no, you said that, that the bonuses were calculated on trading profit, trading but profit. the tax was calculated on a profit line that was net of compensation provisions. What I will do is I will write to you to explain the situation, but I can assure you there is nothing un unusual or uh, peculiar about it. Well, I'm not sure we care whether it was unusual or not. What we care about is whether you are underpaying taxes and overpaying bosses well, by I using two different lines too. of profit. I can understand that concern too. Okay, well, we look forward to that correspondence. Do you believe that Fujitsu should help pay the compensation bill? Well, I think you've heard Mr. Patterson say it, and I agree with, uh, with what he has said. That is that a yes? Yes. Did the Horizon contract require Fujitsu to pass over to you information that was used in prosecutions? Uh, when? Uh, when the prosecutions were underway before 2015? I think it did, yes it did. Okay. Um, Paula Venels said that there was a Fujitsu boss who told her that Horizon was, quotes, like a Fort Knox. Do you know who in Fujitsu made that comment? I don't know that, that was, comment? no. I, saw, I merely saw the, um, the quote in the, in the newspapers. Okay. Um, you've provided no legal assistance to postmasters completing the Horizon Shortfall Scheme application form. Um, do you think that that lack of legal provision is ever going to produce a fair claim? Well, we, in the settlement, the GLA settlement, we specifically identified that we wanted a scheme that didn't require legal support. That was part of the settlement that we had. For the HSS scheme? The HSS scheme. Uh, we wanted it to be as quick and as simple as possible, and that was very much the, uh, the settled part of the settlement. Now, clearly, if that needs to be reviewed, then we will review it. I think less than 10% of people who went through the HSS scheme had legal representation. Do you, do you we, have a, we have an appeals process, and it may well be that it was overly bureaucratic. Well, you know, I think that may be true. But you'd accept the risk, therefore, yeah, of course. that I do. Postmasters, some postmasters will be shortchanged if they didn't have legal advice. I, I'm concerned. We, we, as I say, we specifically set up a scheme that we thought was simple. Uh, and the idea was that people wouldn't need legal representation. Now, clearly, if that is, uh, if that's going to be problematic, or if we believe that there is consequential loss or other issues associated with it, we have an independent appeals process, and we'd be, we'd be happy for I'm people. I'm not to come sure in. that people will want to go through an independent appeals process. No, I can understand that. Too. After I, all I can understand through. that too. But, uh, but in the same, by the same token, 2,400 people have been through the HSS scheme. 82 percent of them. We've have heard there may be hundreds others. more out there. There may well be hundreds more out there, and they will. They should come okay, forward look, if they are. Will you will you undertake to look again at the of process and whether will. legal advice should be will. provided? Thank you. Um, when you've made a settlement to sub postmasters, you've said that they're confidential and they can't be shown to anybody except a lawyer. Now, the impact of that is that sub postmasters can't compare and contrast and talk to each other 
to see whether there is something funny going on. Yes. So will you look again we at will. those confidentiality I understand, clauses? I understand the question you're asking. And the answer is? We will look again. Okay. Um, and the HSS guidance says that sub-postmasters can only recover damages for injury to reputation if they can show financial loss. You must know that's impossible. How could they demonstrate yes, how they can't, That's very difficult for them to demonstrate that. I can see that. That is guidance that should be looked at again? We should look at that. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that concludes the... Just one follow-up, please. Yes, one of course. Um, we heard earlier from Joe and Alan about whether or not there might still be some faults in your system with Horizon and what the current system is being used. Can you reassure us that these systems are working to the full extent? And what... Uh, safety net is there that actually reassures people because as we've already heard there may be instances in which Alan and Joe have heard accounts from people coming to talk to them rather than talk to you about some of the faults with this system. Well we have postmaster user forums, we have better communication, we've overhauled the system, there is no system failure that we are aware of and when a bug does occur we publish it to all postmasters, we explain why it's occurred, we explain what the potential impact of that bug might be. So the system is completely overhauled. It bears no relation whatsoever to the old system. Do you require shortfalls to be made up for by certain postmasters and mistresses? In we, the we ensure that when a shortfall occurs, we have a full investigative process, and there will be no paying up unless there is an agreement with the postmaster and with the organisation, as opposed to the way the presumption of guilt, which was the previous methodology. Thank you very much indeed. You have left us, I think, fairly shocked actually. You've not been able to uh, supply the committee with key events in the timeline such as when the post office first knew that remote access was possible. Um, you've told us that you haven't kept evidence safe about what money was paid to you inappropriately and therefore is owed back and you can't estimate the scale of compensation. We are grateful for the moral commitment from Fujitsu uh, that they will share in the compensation payment but that leaves us many questions which we need to put to the Minister, which is the subject of our next session. That concludes this session. Order, order. Concludes this session. The proceeding is currently suspended. 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 Order, order. Welcome to the fourth session of the Business and Trade Select Committee looking at post office compensation. Minister, I'm very grateful to you and to your officials for spending time with us this morning um, and for your patience as the <coughs> panels have overrun. I'm sure you agree that it was important for us to get some of that evidence on the record. Um, could you just tell us very briefly what your goal for the legislation is, whether it will be a bill that is sponsored by your department, and when you expect us to have the bill introduced? Thank you, Chair, and um, very much very much welcome the uh, sessions you've held today, very informative. Um, what we've always tried to do uh, ever since I've been in post for the last 15 months or so, is get compensa compensation out the door as quickly as possible. It's not going very well, is it? So, uh, we'll come to that, but um, make sure it's fair as possible um, and to hold people to account. So in terms of your question about what we hope to achieve with this, we know of the 983 convictions, only 95 convictions have been overturned, and we can't get money to people with convictions unless we overturn the convictions. So our intention is assess scoped as widely as possible is to overturn all those convictions without those postmasters having to come forward. 
uh, so that everybody, could, all those people could access compensation quickly and easily. And that's what we're trying to achieve in terms of the times, in terms of our department, we expect our department to be the department looking after the legislation. Uh, we expect it to be within weeks. These are challenging, as, we, as you've heard, as you've said yourselves in terms of evidence today. Um, these, this situation is unprecedented. Nobody's tried this, do this before, so it's, it's not straightforward in terms of how we'll scope the legislation, how we'll draft the legislation, but that's a challenge we feel we can meet. Um, and meet within weeks is, a, is the commitment we've made. Will you undertake to introduce a draft bill so that it can go through a very short, sharp process of pre-legislative scrutiny? I, I don't have any objection to that. It's something that uh, um, Bob Neill's asked me to do already in terms of um, looking at this to make sure it is fit for purpose. We want that to be the case so, and we're very keen to work uh, both cross-government and cross-party in, in trying to make sure we get this right first time. And then, just on the timetable, you will have heard, frankly, the appalling stories from Joe Hamilton and Alan Bates today about how long compensation is still taking to be paid, yeah. the way they feel that they're being retried. Now, I've asked you on the floor of the House twice when you uh, will get all of the compensation paid, and on both occasions you've answered by the end of August. When Number 10 briefed last week, however, they said by the end of the year. So can we just get a definitive answer today? When will all of those who need redress have that redress? Well, I very much want hope to hope that it will be by August. Um, not all the situations are within our gift. Not all the different moving parts are within our gift. That's the difficulty with this. Can I be clear, because I think there was some confusion about what's been paid already. Can we just be clear about this? The 2,470, the 2,417 claims to the Horizon shortfall scheme. Over 2,000 of those have been settled. In total, 2,700 uh, cases have been settled. 64% of all claimants. Now, as you've heard, there are three different compensation schemes. So there's the HSS, which is the first scheme to be, to be established. There's a GLO scheme, Group Litigation Order Scheme. Um, and there's the Overturned Conviction Schemes. All have different moving parts. N not everything within those, uh, not every one of those moving parts do we have control over. Um, but we're keen to expedite it wherever possible and one of the ways we've done that of course in recent weeks in recent months is to bring forward what we said is the fixed sum award or the upfront payments however you want to describe that which you heard joe it, hamilton's it, reaction to that sorry you heard joe hamilton's reaction to that well i mean i, I do and i, I we're not saying well, we would never say that the fixed sum award is the right solution for everybody but we need, you know, it is a solution to many, many cases. And um, you heard Neil Hudgel said earlier, I think of the 31 cases that have been settled in overturned convictions, I think 28 of them have been settled by fixed sum awards. So for, for some people with lower level claims, and that's it's a 600,000 level on the overturned convictions, it's 75,000 in the group litigation order, that's not a maximum payment. That's a payment for people we expect with lower level claims. People can simply exit the process which has two benefits. A, it draws a line under the issue for those people. I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong, as Joe Hamilton said, no amount of compensation can ever make good completely for what's happened in the past. But compensation is important. Um, but for some people, they can draw a line under this in terms of seeking compensation quickly, easily, and move out of the process. That's good for them personally, but clearly also good for the remaining people because it shortens the queue for other people. And it has the added benefit of doing that. Um, can I say that? Let me understand yes. why is number 10 briefing the end of the year when you've been really clear with the committee today and with the House twice that the deadline in your it's mind. It's not is a deadline, uh, Chair. It's not a deadline. It's an ambition we want to deliver this scheme by. We've got to frame the legislation. We've got to uh, we've got to then persuade people to come forward for compensation. Uh, those people may choose a number, uh, either of the two routes. Full assessment or fix uh, some award. If people choose a fix some award, it is much much quicker. Literally a couple of weeks that it's taking. If it is full assessment, that is a very significant and complicated process. And this isn't just about this scheme. Can I just say this isn't this yeah. scheme? I was involved in the Lloyd's H Boss compensation scheme. But despite everybody's best efforts and a, and a retired High Court judge in charge of that process, in the end, we had exactly the same problems which is why we brought forward a fixed sum award in that scheme too, and that was very successful. So it is something that will help. It's not the solution for everybody, but it will help. Will Let me help. just pin down then one key question, which is that if you're in the 555 group and you haven't been convicted, 
What is your goal for seeing them secure full redress? August the 7th, and that was the, always the date. You know, that's the, that's the, uh, there was a date because of the way the, the relationship between compensation and, and the Treasury rules are specified, but that's the, the date we want to deliver that by. Now, as I say, you, we can't be in charge charge this whole process, negotiations happen, uh, there are lawyers on either side of the oh, equation, so it does. Yeah. It can take time to negotiate those deals. What's your confidence level then that the unconvicted in the, gr in the 555 group will have, that conf will have that full redress by August? Well, uh, with a fair wind, very good, uh, very high confidence levels, we've made a commitment that we will respond to all submitted claims within 40 days, 90% of claims within 40 working days. If I can just give you some numbers in terms of uh, the performance so far, and I'm very happy you, to and hand what, over to Carl. And you do, could you just yeah. give us the numbers of people in the 555 group who were convicted and those who were non-convicted? Because actually we have struggled as a committee to put that information together from public sources. I think there are 63 that were convicted. That's correct, yes, exactly. 63 of the 555 had convictions. 47 of the 555 have had compensation through the arrangements that the post office are leading on compensating those with overturned convictions. And the amount of money that has gone to that group of 47 people is 17 million so far, and there is more to come. Okay, so we've got a long way still to go. Okay, Mr. Pawsey. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, <coughs> Minister, if I can just go backwards first, and can I first of all say thank you for spending your time this morning listening to all of the evidence. Uh, it's very valuable to have you here. Um, we heard from um, Mr. Bates that when he was asked, why has this taken 20 years, he said it's because the post office had the year of politicians. Was he right? Well, you'd have to ask the various politicians. I mean, clearly, I work with the post office very closely. We meet, meet with Nick Reid on a regular basis. Um, are we challenging in our relationship with the post office? Absolutely, and I, I expect any of my predecessors. Did we to do over that the too. years, Minister? Is the question. Yeah. Sorry. Did we over the past twenty years? I don't think we've been sufficiently challenging. No. Right. I mean, I think this wouldn't have happened, or it would have been, it would have been resolved earlier if we'd been more challenging earlier. But, you know. <laughs> We all make mistakes, Mark. You know, this is, this is, these are challenging things to do. I'm not going to blame any one of my pre predecessors specifically, but um, clearly we, we could have done better. Yeah, and we know that, you know, in any group of people, postmasters included, there will be some who will have done some wrong, and there will have been a number of cases that will have ha had to come on a regular basis. But these were absolutely multiplied, weren't they? So, uh, we heard from Mr. Reid that at no point did anybody in the post office sort of question why the numbers yeah. of... Uh, postmasters being convicted has suddenly started to increase. Why do you think that 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 was unchallenged for so long? Well, if you look at the, there's an interesting graph, and I can show you the research with you. It's uh, some legal research on it. There was about five prosecutions a year happening prior to 1999, and then it suddenly shot up on the introduction of Horizon to 55 average, something like that, and stayed there until until the court case that the. GSF, GFSA well, we both this, if we resource yep. something of that nature happening, that would trigger yep. a question. Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I, you can all speculate what happened in the post office, neither was there at the time. My, my uh, guesstimate on that would be, well, isn't this system great? We're suddenly identifying all these, <coughs> all these people that are stealing money off us. Isn't that great? And I think that would have been perhaps understandable at the time. But at, then as the evidence came in, or people were, the outcry became louder for people like Alan Bates uh, and Joe Hamilton and others, the question should have been answered, clear, asked and answered. Do you accept that there was a, been a pretty unequal relationship between the postmaster and, and the post office? We heard about this big trusted yeah. brand uh, that, could, that could do no wrong. Uh, there were huge resources behind the post office yeah. and the postmasters themselves were, were little people. How can we prevent that kind of relationship occurring in any organisation that government's involved in in the future? I think this happens right across the piece, and I, and I haven't got all the answers to that, but it's something we need to look at very carefully. And I think there was inequality of arms between postmasters and post office. I think the inequality of arms between uh, in the legal process, in the courts, and there's evidence of this. Paul Marshall, a very uh, an important barrister who's worked in this particular area, has, has identified this, that courts often side with the with a larger entity, it's, it's um, rather than the uh, rather than the, the person who's trying to defend themselves. And I think we've got questions. There are questions to answer right across the piece. Right. And if I might ask you a few questions about the legislation that you're bringing yep. forward, that we we, we know is urgently needed. But 
the first question is, you know, there will have been some amongst those members who had done wrong and should have been convicted. How, under your new proposed legislation, are you going to make certain that those who did do something wrong uh, aren't, aren't necessarily exonerated and they don't receive uh, some compensation uh, uh, inappropriately from the taxpayer? Well, that's where we want to be, but I, we've been clear on this. I think there is a significant chance that some people who are actually guilty of something will get compensation. And I think we should be honest about that. And I think it's just a risk that we need to take. A risk that we need to take. As, as we said before, uh, lesser of two evils. I think, um, as Joe Hamilton said in her evidence, it's the only way. I think it's, it's imperfect. But the reality is, yes, we'll try and put mitigations in place. Very happy to hear from this committee about different mitigations we can put in place. I think we've committed to having a statement that people have to sign to say they weren't, we weren't guilty of a theft uh, or uh, you know other things that uh, they may have been accused of or found guilty of but I think it's imperfect. And what would you say to those who've said to us that overturning a conviction without a full process devalues the acquittal of those who went through the courts? Do you accept that? Well again Jo Hamilton said that yeah. she didn't feel her case would have been devalued and what she did because I think we all should I mean it's an incredible story and um, it's been, it was a pleasure to meet Jo some weeks ago so um I hope people don't feel that. I don't think that's right. I think people, if anything, the admiration for people who have gone through this has, has uh, skyrocketed given the dramatisation. So I don't feel that's the case. I think people can see there's this massive, widespread uh, miscarriage of justice. It's not just the scale of it, it's the depth of it. It's the scale of it in terms of the number of people, but it's the depth of it in terms of the impact on people's lives. And I think that's what really came through in that documentary, in that dramatisation. And we acknowledge that you're moving as fast as you can, but what do you make of the Scottish First Minister's announcement that overturning convictions for post office scandal victims in Scotland will happen immediately? I think that's, um, I welcome it. You know, we're very keen to work with our, our counterparts in different, in those jurisdictions, Northern Ireland as well, to make sure. We're trying to do this on a UK-wide basis and be consistent. Okay, and how can the government make sure that the criminal records um, of those who were convicted are expunged as quickly as possible? Well, that's what the we've got a draft of legislation to do, and it's it's complex. We had meetings on it yesterday, and we'll have meetings. And I spoke to the Justice Secretary about it last night. It's not straightforward, but there's some eminent people on this on this committee that will no doubt get the views of how we do that. But um, we're keen to do it as quickly as possible. Thank you, Thank you. I, I welcome Minister the Patrick Shaw willing to cons consult widely as to how best we achieve that, you know, and my committee is happy to help you with that. But can, can we get one thing clear, uh, that uh, this is an exceptional step, yeah, isn't it, it is. to deal with a wholly exceptional circumstance? Yeah. Uh, and will the government make it clear in however way the registration is framed and prevented that this is not and could never be uh, used as a precedent for undermining mm. the basic principle of the independence of the judiciary uh, when they're considering both criminal and civil cases. That's you, fundamental, isn't absolutely, it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you have that commitment from me. Anything you think we need to do to set that out, the reasons why we're doing this, the, the fact that this is suboptimal, the fact that this is uh, the least worst option uh, route we're taking, and any way we can define this to exclude the possibility of this having to do this again interfere with the judicial process. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm all ears and very keen to work with you to do that. It would be fair, fair also to say that <clears throat> the decision to proceed by this exceptional route doesn't imply any criticism of the judiciary or the way they've handled matters on the information available to them at the time. Absolutely. Not at all. And it does, all, it does illustrate the inequality of arms, as I say, in court-based processes, and we saw that in the dramatisation. And, and in, the, in the real world, that's what, exactly what mm -hmm. did happen. So, um, but yes, no criticism whatsoever. Used to have a great system called legal aid, but uh, Ian Lavery. With, with regard to compensation, Minister, yep. we've heard this morning. I think you've been in for most of the, most of the session. There's a massive issue which seems to be outstanding, perhaps ignored, and that's the the fact that so postmasters and the so post officers are like a family business, and we're looking at compensation for the victims only. We've had women widowed, mm. we've had children losing their father or their mother mm. as a result of this. We've had people separated, never to see each other again. We've had kids who have had to move communities. What will the government do to make sure that fair and rightful compensation uh, is given to 
the, the, the people other than the victims, but part of the, the, the Supus Mostos family, as it were. Yeah. It's heartbreaking. I mean, I, um, in my own constituency, I've got uh, Sam Harrison, who was the postmaster at Norton near Helmsley, and who sadly passed away last May, who was part of the 555, and uh, I've spoken to her, uh, one of her sons, and their uh, heartbreaking situations, and um, what they've been through, as well as the fact that now they lost their mum. Um, compensation, of course, will be paid to the, the family, to their state, which then goes through, flows through to those individuals that way. I think there's two questions right here, and again, we're, we're talking to the advisory board about this, and it's been absolutely vital, I think, in getting to the place we are today. The advisory board does a fantastic job, and it covers all three schemes, and, um, and also includes it, as well as Lord Abuthnut, Kevin Jones, and Richard Moorhead, um, Chris Hodges, that being the chair. Um, but they've talked about family members, impact on family members. It's something we are talking to them about. I'll, I'll be honest, and I always seek to be honest with this committee, there's a ner nervousness around that in that directly compensating family members in that you could say this for any compensation, sh compensation scheme we run with contaminated blood, you could say this about, about some of the banking uh, 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 some of the banking scandals, all those things, all those families are affected, of course, but it would hugely increase the scope and complexity of the uh, compensation schemes and, of course, the cost of the, comp of the compensation schemes. So it's not, it wouldn't be an easy thing to do to open it up to family members, but, um, um, but I understand the point you're making. Mr Hickenbottom. I think it's me. Oh. Anthony. Two Anthony's thank next door to each other. Um, Minister, thank you. Thank you for sitting through and, and, and being here. Um, can I just ask, with the question that I ended with, with Lord Arbuthnot, why are we still using Horizon? Uh, again, that's the least worst option as well. I mean, um, it, this is one of the biggest uh, IT systems, IT networks, I think, in Europe, and um, if not the world. So it's a significant thing to replace. It's being replaced. I think the cost so far replacing it is around 270 million pounds. Um, it's being rebuilt, and we want to and, and uh, to get people off Horizon as soon as possible. Um, so, but the system they're using now, as far as we're aware, is far more reliable than previous versions. They have those. Some of the difficulties have been resolved. I think, or all the difficulties have been resolved in terms of the course, the problems in the past. But it's something that the post office wants to move away from and that's and that is something that they, we are funding to help the post office with funding for to be able to do that can I, can I just push you on this because you know that is what everyone said at the beginning here is the biggest and best system uh, I think it was said in Europe isn't it fantastic we're going to make it easier for, for those who work in the post office and look at where we are now mm. you've now got the people who messed up the system that's putting it politely Still, create, still running the operating system that those who work in the post office are using. So, I mean, I, I guess that this, it all comes back to trust, it all comes back to confidence in the system. You can't be that confident that people out there working in the post office at the moment are confident and trust the system they're using. Indeed, even in the run-up to this inquiry, I think a number of us went out and have spoken to sub-postmasters and mistresses across the country. I don't really think I've spoke to a single one out of the 10 or 15 that I spoke to, both past and present who had any confidence in that system. So we've been here before, we've heard about IBM, we've heard about Amazon, these are all falling through the cracks and not being implemented, these new systems, these new uh, organizations to try and, try and run them. Why aren't we expediting that? Because 25 years should be enough time to change the system altogether. Well, that's the reason it's been rebuilt. We're moving off it. I mean, um, but as you know, the IT, pro pro uh, IT projects are notoriously slower than expected and more costly than expected, and that's, this is no different. Um, but you can't just rip a system out overnight. You have to rebuild it. It has to be right. It has to be fit for purpose. <laughs> you have to make sure it doesn't have this, carry the same flaws as previous versions. Now, I think we're a lot further on in terms of IT capability, uh, in terms of deployment this uh, this these kind of technologies than we were 25 years ago. So there's every reason to um, expect that it's a much more robust system, and, and uh, it is being piloted uh, currently in, in a number of branches, but um, it, these things do take time. What safeguards do you think you can or ought to provide then for someone who doesn't have com confidence in the system that they're currently using because of historical reasons? So do you say, actually, rather than going through the horizon helpline, 
that your department should have actually a dedicated helpline for people to be able to contact you if they are not confident with the response and relationship they're getting from the organisation that's running their operating system. I think you've got to be careful that we don't end up running the post office. That's not what we do, not what we want to do, not what we've got expertise to do. So you've got to have confidence in the management (laughs) to do that. That's their responsibility. And they've also got the responsibility to put in the checks and balances needed to make sure this this system is for purpose. Can I just uh, draw you back to Joe Hamilton's comments about the chronology of payments? That actually, you know, we can we can talk about all of the compensation schemes. That actually, it's quite important to make sure that we're getting it right in terms of those who have been waiting the longest are making sure their systems are being addressed. Given what you've heard this morning, how do you think you can go back and help speed up the process, deal with the bureaucracy? We've heard Mr. Reid say what he's going to do. What can you do from your position to speed up the timelines here? Well, certainly, you know, um, I might hand it to Carl here because we look after the the, um, the DBT looks after the GLO scheme, and we've made commitments in terms of turning turnaround, uh, in terms of responses to uh, claims that have been submitted. Um, we're very keen to do that. Uh, the 40 working days rule in 90 percent of cases. Um, we're determined to slim down the bureaucracy. We're working with the advisory board. They've made recommendations and or making recommendations how we can expedite payments, which we're keen to do. We've implemented some things already, not least the fixed sum award across the two schemes. But uh, Carl, you may want to comment. No, thank you. I certainly think that the 75k fixed sum offer should help us with maybe up to a third of the claimants within the GLO cohort, looking at the data that we have received so far. And definitely we have a strong record from the impact of the 600,000 fixed sum offer for the overturned conviction, so I hope that will help. Um, I wanted to put on record the fact that we have had 59 claims into the department within that cohort that you were mentioning earlier, the 478 claimants. So we aren't sitting there with a large number of unprocessed claims. We designed this process, frankly, trying to learn lessons from some of the criticisms of the Horizon shortfall scheme by working closely with claimants' lawyers. So we employed Freeths to help us design this scheme, and we included within that design steps such as the request for medical advice, forensic accountancy advice and so on from experts. So we are delivering a scheme, having consulted the claims lawyers that works within that process. But we do need, we do need to go further and faster. I totally recognise that. But so far, we've had 59 claims in so far, and we have given out offers of 44, of which 29 have been accepted. So m- much more to do, and a lot of claims to come. But it's not that they are sitting on our desk at the moment on process. Yeah, I, I understand the need to consult lawyers to make sure the system works, but I've never found a lawyer doing anything quickly in my life. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, this is slightly the problem here. Sorry, my, but my respects. <laughs> Apologies, I don't mean to be rude about previous witnesses, um, especially with the good work you're doing. But perhaps you could possibly provide timelines on this, because I don't think you are hitting those targets of 40 days. I don't think you are seeing the delivery of, um, of the compensation that people are asking for in the times that you are suggesting. And I don't know if it's possible for you to provide this committee with that evidence so that we can actually not only scrutinise it, but publish it as well. Could I quickly come back on that? Because following the previous hearing um, where we came and gave evidence um, a while ago, we have been writing on a quarterly basis to the chair of the committee to provide data across all of the compensation schemes. And following your recommendations, we have gone further and are now publishing that data on a monthly basis. The most recent report was issued yesterday, which included those statistics that I just gave you. So we're happy to provide further information on top of that. Um, And we will, I think, next month be assessing whether we are delivering against that 90% 90% target for, for 40 working days. That is quite a stretching target, but we're happy to give you an update on that particular the, statistic. The, the, the key thing is the target has got to take aim at, check out the door. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Can I just make the point that, I get, again, if you look at all the schemes, they are very slow at the start, but, just, but that's where these schemes are because it, there, there is a, it takes a while to start filling the pipeline and coming through. But if you look at the HSS, 85% of claimants have been had full and final settlements of the offers that have been made, the ones that applied in the original timescale. It's not as if people sit around doing nothing. If you look at the people on the independent panel and the HSS, they include people like Lord Garnier, eight eminent KCs, six friends accountants. Well, I've been a minister long enough to know that very often words are used that like processing and settlement offered and there are all kinds of words that we can invent to basically give okay. a summary Money in the bank. of a Absolutely. stage of the process. The key thing that we need, to basically, is the target for when is the check out the door, basically. Yeah. Well, if you look That's at the 31, what we've got to measure against. The 31 overturned convictions, 29 of those checks are in the bank of the... Of the yeah. uh, so we will now, I think, use the check in the bank 
target as a way of I'm very happy practice. to do that. Mind if I just ask two final ones, um, and for, uh, Minister? Um, you know, who should be t picking up the bill here for this, Fujitsu or the taxpayer? You know, I feel that might be an obvious answer. And then can I just, uh, the second part to this is that if Fujitsu, as you've heard in this morning's session, is going to offer, so they feel there's a moral obligation. They feel that they may offer some money in the future. Are we then opening up another scheme? And how is that scheme going to work to make sure that that compensation is effectively reaching all of the people who have been impacted and, of course, successfully processed by yes. it? We're not, August this year. we're not opening a new scheme. What I so what do you do with the compensation? Anticipate, well, that money should go back to pay for the taxpayer what they've had to fund. It is a, bi a, bi a billion pounds. It's not being funded by the post office. That's why it doesn't set on their accounts, because the taxpayer is picking up the tab. So any, any contribution from Fujitsu, and I welcome the commitment made today in this conversation we've had previously between officials, and we think it's a timing thing in terms of maximising the contribution to the taxpayer in terms of when we have that proper discussion about about contribution to the bill but it's a very significant bill it may north of a billion pounds our suspicion is that it will so that's a very very <coughs> significant contribution the taxpayer is making and it's very welcome we should thank the taxpayer for doing that and uh, but also we should expect people who have contributed to the scandal to contribute financially yeah, thank you Let me bring you mr labor and then anthony uh, Minister, was that, do, you, do you think there was ever a, a perception that the inward investment from Fujitsu, also from Japan, uh, was that great that the government like took a back seat and didn't want to, to interfere with this at uh, the very beginning for fear of losing inward investment? And, and secondly, um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, I'm only understanding that the government always had uh, one person on the board, at least one person on the board of the post office all the way through. Was the, that a government nomination and nominee, uh, did they not come forward with any information with regard to what was happening at any stage during this whole period? Um, well, listen, we welcome anybody who wants to invest in this country, as long as they're a bona fide actor. And um, so um, has that influenced any decision I've made or any conversation I've had with any of my colleagues or, or with the Secretary of State in terms of whether we, ha how, we how we go about getting Fujitsu to contribute, for example? Never. That has never been a factor. And never would it be. Uh, and um, so, uh, <clears throat> so, no, uh, you know, we... We purely think, for, my, for the 15 months I've been in, in my particular uh, role, it's a timing thing. We want to establish exactly who is guilty and the, the extent of their contribution to the scandal and then make sure that the, that the money, the contribution is commensurate with, that, with the, the contribution they've made towards the scandal in the first place. Um, in terms of w who knew what in, from the government on the board, we have a representative from UKGI who sits on the board. Um, currently, I don't know about that relationship in the past. I don't know what they knew or they didn't know in terms of the uh, relevant um, person from government. I don't know if Carl can add any information to that, but um, but I do think it's right that we don't try and duplicate what the inquiry is doing. It's a very complex set of circumstances. It should be given time to report, which it should do complete at the end of this year. Hopefully, report soon after. Then we'll know who knew what, or we should have known what, and should have done what and we can then assign blame accordingly. No, I, I agree with that analysis. I don't think it's factually correct that there was a government representative throughout that period from 1999 through to now. I think at one point, the post office was part of Royal Mail Group, and I don't believe there was a government representative on the board of, of Royal Mail. I couldn't tell you factually when that changed and when the shareholder executive first put someone on to the, to the board that oversaw the work of the post office, but I think it's, it's that sort of factual distinction I would make. Thank you. Thank you. Anthony. Thank you, Chair. Um, Just briefly. Minister, you heard all the previous evidence. You'll have heard Nick Reid talk about the final compensation bill, and he didn't think a billion was accurate. You've just said probably north of a billion. How are your figures so different? Well, yes, you ask. I mean, I know the facts. I mean, I, I, don't, I can't speak for, for Nick Reid, and it's something that we're picking the tab of, so probably we're picking, taking a a closer look at it. It's, it's a maximum figure that a billion quid currently specified, and clearly we have got having the taxpayer picking at the tab of this. We've got to calculate what we think the impact will be, and um, and that figure at the moment uh, is set at a maximum of a billion pounds. Now, what we did last week in terms of the overturning the convictions, 
will have a massively material effect on that because it opens the door for compensation for a, a significant uh, a significant increase in the number of people that will come forward and have access to compensation. I had an email myself only, uh, only I think yesterday or the day before from somebody saying they've overturned the convictions already, they were never intending to enter this process. By doing what we've done in terms of the fixed award, for example, they're, they're now entering the process, so it will happen very quickly. And I think the combination of the fixed award and the, the mass overturning of convictions will have a significant Im impact on the number of people that receive compensation, and quite rightly too. So do you think there is a naivety, a lack of curiosity in the post office management about the compensation bill? Could I come in on the, the factual point around what Mr Reid said? He was referring to what was included in the accounts that were published at the end of last year, which preceded the announcement last week. So the, the assessment that was done at that point was on the basis of the low number of people that had come forward, which is what has driven the policy change that we've been discussing with the Minister since before Christmas that led to the announcement last week. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't impact on the post office accounts. It's as simple as that. It's a, it's a, it's a taxpayer's... Uh, Does that result in a, a lack of curiosity on the part of the post office management? Well, you, they don't need to be you, concerned with it. It's a, probably a question not for me. I, um, I think, it, to me, it's not relevant in terms of the major issue here, which is accelerating compensation. It makes no difference in terms of getting compensation out the door, whether they're curious or not. I think um, it's incumbent on all of us involved in this process to try and accelerate every part of the process. What I did welcome from Nick Reid was his commitment to look again at the process and streamline it, because there were some very concerning, uh, concerning evidence from Neil Hodgell about some of the complexities, some of the delays in responses. That shouldn't happen. There should be enough resources there to respond quickly to any uh, any simple, uh, simple query, simple question to try and resolve these matters as quickly as possible. So, certainly welcome that. I accept your point about you know it doesn't impact the compensation, but does it not talk to the culture in the post office that sub postmasters are still dealing with that same organisation that is not interested in the final provision, that is not curious about you know you heard the the, the questions and the answers throughout the whole morning. Yeah, um, it may do. I, mean, I don't feel that's the thing that's holding back people getting access to compensation. Uh, I think the it, bureaucracy, red tape, whatever you want to call it, is an inevitable fact of life in our lives. We want to, we want to minimise it wherever possible. Where we can cut that red tape, make it easier to get access to compensation. We will do everything we can to do that. Thank you very much. Just a couple of questions to um, wrap up. You'll have heard uh, Joe Hamilton referring to the £75,000 upfront payment to settle cases. Um, as out of touch and wouldn't even cover the interest on what's been stolen from them by the Post Office Limited. What's your response to that? <coughs> it depends on the level of your claim. I think in, in some like Joe Hamilton's case, clearly that would be the case, but that isn't what the Fixed Sum Award is all about. It's saying to people with lower value claims, if you've got a claim potentially for £10,000, as somebody may have, £75,000 is quite a lot of money for those people and we'll take them out of the queue because all those people will have to go through a process of, uh, of compiling uh, and, and then uh, uh, submitting a claim which is then responded to. All those people can come out of the queue. I think Alan's question earlier when he said, you know, what will happen to people who have already accepted 30000 for example, they'll all get topped up to £75,000. So in the GLO, the minimum you'll get is £75,000. It takes lots of people out of the queue who would have been uh, accessing lower level claims. It does not help people like Joe, uh, Joe if I can call her, call her Joe, Joe Hamilton, um, it, but it, only to the extent there are fewer people then to, who are accessing the full assessment process. So you'd accept which is then better. that in cases like Joe Hamilton's, the process has been much too slow to date and does now need speeding up? Absolutely. Okay. Let me just check a couple of the recommendations that we've made as a committee with you because the committee has been working on this for uh, some time. So in 2022, we obviously demanded that the government ensure that the 555 were compensated fully on the same basis as other victims. The GLO scheme was set up and you've been able to give the committee this afternoon a goal of settling those claims by the end of August, is that correct? 7th of August, I think I said. But, um, no, you're right. And uh, of your 18 recommendations, I think we implemented 12 and uh, implemented the others in different ways. And indeed, in GLO, I stood up in Parliament myself well, as a backbencher and, uh, and called for the same thing as you called for. Uh, to, uh, we're we're going to go through. Two. So the, the, the second recommendation that we made 
is we recommended that government urgently put in place an independent intermediary body to support victims of um, the Horizon scandal in seeking redress. That was rejected by the government and today we have heard evidence that there may be hundreds more victims out there who haven't had the confidence to come forward. Uh, we have also heard uh, the Chief Executive of the Post Office say that he agrees that the guidance for um, the HSS scheme um, is going to need some revision. Um, do you think government was wrong to reject that recommendation of the committee last year? No, I mean, the CCRC plays that role as an independent body, of course, and, and people can go to the CCRC. The CCRC themselves wrote to all uh, those with convictions and asked them to come forward. Citizens' advice also was available to people. So it's I think like you ever tried to get hold of citizens' advice. Well, that's a slightly <laughs> different, no, one there's for a different inquiry, perhaps. Left in this um, but um, um, but I think the um, the biggest issue we have, um, what I don't think the committee did recommend what we've done last week, which is unprecedented. Which is that we think when it, we looked at all this and to do this quickly, we looked at expediting the process within the CCRC. Um, different ways we could do that, increasing resources, everything we looked at would have taken years to deliver. So we came down on the uh, very significant and unprecedented step, mm. uh, the unprecedented step of taking a mass overturning well, convictions we, route. We also recommended that government set stretching targets to address the backlog and um, the Right Honourable Member for Sutton and Cheam, uh, Mr Scully, set out an ambition of 100% of initial offers under the historic shortfall scheme to be made by the end of 2022. And the post office chief exec committed to making initial compensation offers to about 95% of claimants by the end of 2022. Those targets have been missed. And I apologize for us missing them. You know, it's, there's no shortage of appetite or willingness to do it. Some th these things take longer than we expect. I've seen every compensation scheme I've ever worked with as a backbencher um, and there's no difference with this one as, as a minister. It's more complex than, than um, we probably initially anticipate. But um, is there ambition to get that money out the door as quickly as possible? That's our number one priority. Is our ambition to make sure it is fair and seen to be fair? That's our number two priority because, and that's what the advisory board is there for. Is it our ambition to, uh, is it our priority to make sure people are held to account for what's gone wrong? Absolutely, and that's what the inquiry is there for. Well, look, you've told the committee today that you thought the progress in making payments and redress was much too slow, um, that you are going to bring forward a bill to try and speed it up. You're going to look at whether that is going to be a draft bill so that it could go through pre-legislative scrutiny. And you've been really clear with the committee that your goal for checks in the bank is around August time. So thank you very much indeed uh, for your evidence today, both of you. And thank you very much for your patience um, with our overrunning session today. That concludes our session. Order, order. The proceeding has ended. 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 The proceeding has ended.
The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended. The proceeding has ended.